Highway Hero. Perez Hilton. Wasn't that wasn't that like a TMZ guy? Um Garfunkel. Dude, you're my Garfunkel. I feel like Garfunkel. Why well, could be your Garfunkel? I'm kind of like a Garfunkelish. I'm not the singer either. <laughs> Mini Moose. <laughs> Fallout Boy. <laughs> Do you, okay. do, you want, do you want to take note of when I've turned this camera on? So if we need to splice it, we can. No. Or you, all right. So does it matter. on right now? Recording right now. Yeah. Right, I will make a note right here. You want me just to start it now? Second cam. You start when you're ready. You tell me when you're ready. It's, uh, it is. Do you want me to... no, okay, that's, a good shot. that's a good view right there. All right. Here we go. Five, four. Three, two, one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Rock 50, and roll. Fifty plus years of IT experience combined, right here. High I mean, tech. This is high tech right now. Managed right? to get our um, our shit together. Love it. All on the fly too, man. That's the best. That's it. Live without a net. All right. So um, hold on. I just got a tasty beverage from my beverage supply. Go right ahead. What are you having tonight, Mike? I have green tea right now. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh shit! Am is, I... that, is that the seventeen-year-old? What's that? Is that the seventeen-year-old green tea? Yeah, it's aged and uh, and spiced and all that good stuff. Fun. I have the Ardberg Yardbird. You know what? Thanks to Kevin Dushney. Did us a solid by bringing this, although I don't know how to open it. Oh, there it is. Rocking and rolling. Props, Kevin. We got to get him back on the podcast. I think he's still embarrassed from the last one. Oh, oh, I think you had so much fun. I'll go up and get, maybe I'll go up and get something when you're reading. You want to hear me read? I do, but if I, if I, you might use that as the break to run upstairs and get something, grab something out oh, of that hello. cabinet there in a few minutes. Oh. All right. I keep breaking the corks every time I open one of his bottles he gave me. I'm just so, so humanly. Unhuman. Hey, what are we talking about today? Hey, well, first of all, I'm sorry that I'm in the barn and Mike is not, because you know why? I have the COVID again. <laughs> Third time's the charm, though. Are you got, feeling good, though? You're feeling fine, right? I sneezed for mostly half of Saturday. Just started sneezing. Yeah. Took a test. Positive. And then that was all I had was sneezing. Hmm. So, which has happened the, the last two times I had it, it, it was always just sneezing. I got like a headache the second time. But anyway, um, this is not the coronavirus podcast. This is the Calculus of IT podcast, AKA the AIAF podcast, AKA the Cognitive Load, the home of the Cognitive Load. Uh, Mike and I are doing the remote zoom thing tonight because I could just said I have COVID, but I think it'll work out. Um, we have multiple cameras going, so we should be able to sort this out. Um, and the barn is like my quarantine area now. So I'm in here first thing in the morning and I don't leave here until I go in the house straight to the quarantine room. I'm kind of just like isolated, which isn't so bad, I suppose. Um, so before we begin, Tonight, a few tids and tads for you. We said last week that we would be um, launching a new podcast called the AIAF podcast. But as it turns out, <laughs> neither of us has any time to do a second <laughs> podcast. Uh, so like all amazing drunken ideas that sound amazing at the time, we're going to be bringing we ever, 
I don't think we ever okay. sobered up sobered up after we talked about that. And that's what happened. Right. Yeah, right exactly. We were like, we were like, wait, what did we say to we do? <laughs> so we're going to bring back the AI AF news segment into the calculus of it podcast yeah. for now. And then we'll <laughs> revisit launching AI AF as a separate podcast later. There's just so much damn AI news that like a week goes by and everything that all the research I've done, everything I've prepared is already old. True. So, so what I'll do is like, if you haven't noticed already, I break up the chapters of this podcast. I will break up the chapter even more so that after we do the chapter discussion, we will then, uh, I'll, I'll make a cut in the podcast so that you can then listen to the AI AF segment, or you can break camp, but you should listen to it because there's tons of crazy shit going on with AI and, um, you should be informed more so than you get from CNN or Fox. Um, also, oh, Mike, we have a limited supply of our new, check it, AI nice. stickers. I love it. That's fantastic. Yep. So uh, Mike and I are going to be putting these all over the world as we travel, just like <laughs> sticking the things and places and people. Like uh, uh, probably more mostly USB around Massachusetts. What's that? Like sprinkling USB drives with Trojan Just horses on them all over the place. Food kits. <laughs> we'll probably end up posting them mostly around Massachusetts. But um, if you do see one, and the first person to see it at that location takes a selfie with it, and then hits us on the Insta at Calculus of IT, we'll get a free hoodie, a kick-ass AI AF hoodie. So I'm just gonna start putting these all over the place. Maybe on the bumper of your car. Maybe on the men's stall at uh, the Copley. I don't know. Whatever. Wherever I am, <laughs> I'm putting stickers up. My slap some stickers up. Grab a picture. Get a free hoodie from the AIAF Calculus of IT Nexus of Nether Cognitive Load Podcast. Love it. We're loving it. Um, Mike, I got to get these to you, by the way, uh, as soon as I stop being COVID positive. Um, also, if you want to continue the conversations uh, about what you hear tonight or any episode, um, you can hit us up on LinkedIn, which people have been doing with me. But we also have a Discord channel, uh, which and, and you can get the invite link at our website, thecoit.us. Um, it's also in the podcast notes. But join our Discord board. Uh, we're it's starting to ramp up, getting some good conversations going. And we talk about whatever's on the show or just tell us that we're asshats. Um, either way, we're just going to try and have some positive discussion about um, all the amazing things going on in IT. And uh, also, if you're in the habit of giving out ratings for shows and you like our show, please give us five stars on the Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube or wherever you listen to the show. In our show description, we have links to our Buy Us a Beer portal. Do it. And, uh, Do it. Go buy us so if you want to buy us a beer it's pretty easy just click on the buy us a beer link in the podcast description god knows we can drink it um right away i drank all the robitussin with uh the mountain dew i had so now i'm like back to the scotch i had my i had all my drink my purple drink um so if uh we also have a merchandise store which is pretty sweet uh, a lot of people have been buying a lot of cool shirts uh, we have the sad salad shirts. We have the new AIAF ponies. Um, we have the original AIAF shirts. And um, we also have, well, there's lots of stuff in there. Uh, I've tried to slip in a few hidden items, but the good people over at um, spreadshirt.com quickly generally catch my uh, trademark violations and kick me out. But they haven't canceled me like another shitty uh, t shirt site that I won't mention that rhymes with Shopify. Um, <laughs> On the show, <laughs> you're getting uh, closer and closer, and now you finally made it. I'm just not. I'm not going to say their name. It's mine. Um. Good. So anyway, um, last week was apparently our most popular episode because I got tons of feedback, um, about the employee experience, and uh, a lot of people that I chatted with were going through similar journeys and trying to figure out where employee experience or ex 
fits into their organizations, whether they were in IT or HR or um, other areas of IT, actually, um, that aren't necessarily uh, general operational IT. Um, but we're going to come back to it. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a massive topic. Uh, in fact, we've been talking about it now for a couple of chapters, and we're going to keep going for the next couple of chapters, including tonight. But we didn't get to DEI. We didn't get to hybrid work. We didn't get to inclusive management. We didn't get to any of the critical interwoven aspects of EX either. So I promise you, we will keep revisiting this. Um, and we could do a whole episode on process mapping alone, Mike, uh, which is another huge key to EX. Uh, yeah. I, I, we should, I'm going to, we should, I'm going to put that down. Because you know, you map, mapping a single process, like literally employee life cycle, it's a freaking big deal. Once you see it and have it. Anyway, uh, well, cheers, Mike. Virtual cheers. Cheers, man. Virtual clinky. Mm. Mm. Rock and roll. Titillating. For relaxing times. Relaxing times. So tonight is an exciting topic. I know I always say that. But to me, these are exciting things to talk about, especially when booze is readily available. But in truth, tonight we're talking about how to work with your partner. Oh, Lordy. This is somewhat serendipitous, Mike, would you say? Kind of. Sure. Sure? Yeah. Sure. Uh, sure is the word. <laughs> I, 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 heard, I heard you're getting a new uh, partner soon. I am. I'm very excited. Very excited. Um. I, I might know that person. I, I think I think we both know her very well. I think she's been on this podcast three times. Yeah. Yes. This is true. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um well we maybe... <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, I won't give away her name, but it rhymes with uh Kate Roush Bosman, um, <laughs> who'll be leaving my cast and joining Mike's cast to become his lieutenant, which is an awesome turn of events for a lot of reasons. So wishing you both the best. Uh, tonight's tonight's episode is dedicated to you, Mike. Oh, thank you. Because um, when I wrote this chapter back in 2020, 2021, uh, I wrote it actually with two people in mind. Um, Steve Simmons, who we had on episode two, oh. and Kate Roush, both of whom have been steady lieutenants for many, many years. So. Um, I think that you'll find a lot of what you hear tonight in this chapter read is is relevant to how I took the approach towards um, bringing in my first partner and uh, working with them to sort of build out IT from the, from the ground up. Yeah. Next week, we're talking about training and education. And okay, this one's going to be exciting too, no lie. Um, and also a mega big, mega big episode because it's so critical. However, uh, Mike may not be able to be here next week. And if he's not, then we're going to wait a week because this is a big one. Yeah. And I have a lot to ask or kind of pry on that one too. So yeah. Training so education. I mean, it's a huge part of EX. So we're going to keep this EX party going all season long. So if we don't have the chance to do an episode next week, don't worry. I have um, some alternate filler for next week, which is exciting. Uh, good times. Are you going to spin some records? I'm going to DJ some 1999 era Armin Van Buren and Paul Van Dyke, um, which can't possibly get banned by YouTube. So um, that Oakenfold uh, set you sent me was incredible. Essentials of Cream. Yeah. yeah, that was unbelievable. That's timeless. That will sort of that's like Dark Side of the Moon, man. It'll it never, it'll never get old. And then there was another one. Uh, I think you sent me the next day. And that was incredible. It's just such a, it's so uplifting. And it's like. Armin Van Buren's top 30 ever. Oh, that remix. So, yeah. So great. I mean, that whole era. If you were, if you, if you were alive and had the chance to enjoy it. I mean. Bully for you because that was, uh, that was a good time. It was a good was time. To kick out shows. It like it's still going on a lot more in Europe. I mean, there's still so much of that happen, Like so much. Yeah. So many events, like it's kind of dead here now, it seems. Trance trance hasn't, I mean, if you listen to Armin Van Buren's sets now, they're a little bit more progressive, but still very trancey. I mean, still very much the same, 
You still hear the big hits. You still hear the big anthems, the club crushers. But um, I'm dating myself now. And also, it's weird for a 50-year-old guy to talk about this. So I'll just stop. But I anyway. Makes no. it's, it's, who you, it's who you are. You know, it, it makes oh, man. I found this Oakenfold gate crasher set from 99 just recently that I thought I had lost forever. And I just remember listening to that 10,000 times. Um, incidentally, by the way, uh, completely unrelated, but uh, on one of the um, Pete Tong pod, uh, replays from of Paul Paul Oakenfold, uh, I commented on a the guy who posted it that um, I had originally hosted that on my hotline server back in 2002 um, at Trans Universe, the hotline server, and he had been a person on my server. He's like, wait, you were Trans Universe? I was like, yeah. He's like, oh my god, like you had everything. I was like, yes, I did. <laughs> and Roadrunner never again, never got wind of it. So, um, okay, Mike, I got a pass to BioIT World. Are you going? Yes. Okay. So Mike and I are going to be going to BioIT World. I tried to get press pass. I was rejected. So I um, pimped myself out to a vendor to speak on their behalf um, so I could get a free pass. We will be there. We will be doing a live podcast. We will be going up to all the vendors that we like and talking to them, even the vendors we don't, talking to them too. We're going to just do a ton of recording. If you're at BioIT World or you're in Boston on April 16th or 17th, let us know. We will sit down with you. We will buy you booze. Uh, we'll have a good time. We'll talk about IT, whatever. Um, it'll be fun. It'll all go in the podcast. Big, long BioIT World podcast. So, um, oh, forget, before I forget. So, uh, Swear, S-W-A-R-E, um, maker of The rescue platform uh, is letting me publish the recording of our um, discussion a few weeks ago from next next gen validation. Um, even if you're not in life sciences, it's a great talk about um, using AI to sort of decipher compliance. So um, I'll be posting that as an episode on our podcast. They gave me the the rights to do that. It's a pretty awesome discussion. Uh, so that'll be coming out too. I think I'll put it out put that out end of this week um, or early next week. Um, I want to just go through it one more time, but it was an awesome discussion. So hopefully um, everyone digs that one when we post it on our podcast. Anything else you want to make mention of Mike? Any, any hot tamales? No, not at this point. We can uh, talk about some stuff a little down the line here. Okay. So tonight we're talking about working with your partner. I have a not softball question for you. Sure. Uh, so you, are you strapped in? You ready to go? I'm ready to go. Okay. Let's go. All right. So, Mike, you're about to get your um, first IT partner in a very long time. Your first new IT partner in a long time, about a, about a week and a half away. Um, so what do you believe? And by the way, she's going to hear you say this. So yeah, what yeah. do you believe is the most critical factor in building a successful collaborative relationship between you the head of IT, and your new deputy, your new sidekick. And how have you personally worked to cultivate that in your career? Sure. Uh, transparency and trust are the two big things. I think to start out, it's to get to know that person. Luckily, I think with Kate, I have a good idea of who she is and how she operates. And we've connected really well through prior to the interview process. So it's Little little bit of uh, head start, which is good, but uh, in the past we've had to bring in number twos. It's really about transparency and what the team's purpose and what we're looking to achieve is, and instantly letting people know that they can take things and run with them, that they can own them, that they can take a look at what's in the overall plan for the year, and grab hold of something that's important to them that they want to that they want to build and want to learn and make sure that they're empowered to do that um, while also just making sure you have that clear transparent plan of what the expectations are and I think that's trust and transparency are key and to be joined at the hip that first 30 days and you give, give a good overview of the company strategy and the IT strategy so what do you 
so that's a great answer, by the way. Trust, transparency. I would agree. Trust is probably at the top of my list as well. Yep. Uh, developing trust is interesting. Yes. Right. Like, how how do you what what what's your advice to somebody who's bringing on a number one or number yep. two? I haven't decided what we're going to call it yet. Let's say a number one, bringing in their, their number one. What's the best way you think to establish trust as fast as possible? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, I mean, you know, Kate, so yep. already you have a relationship that you feel is grounded in some basic level of trust, but you still have to develop a, a level of trust with her to take something on by herself. Mm -hmm. Even though you know she's extremely talented, like how do you develop trust? Well, for, for me, often it's, you know, through the interview process and, and whatnot, we've touched on a, a number of key areas in which there's a value of someone coming on board, especially as a number two, number one person. So this I just call it number one, by the way. Number one. So uh, <laughs> who does number two work for? Um, there's some expectations that the things that they are driven to plug into and get working with. Um, I'm always there to talk to and give guidance, but their opportunity is right out of the gate to go and try and achieve that and meet and partner with the business, give them the opportunity to, to really socialize their capabilities and their role in the company um, and empower them to do that. I'm very much, um, just my style is very kind of a hands-off style with anyone that I bring in, I'm always there and we work together on a lot of the technical problems that the company may need to solve right out of the gate. But it's often giving that person the opportunity to go out and and execute on things pretty quickly as they're comfortable. We can gauge that together as a team because I always think of the number one as really a, a real extension of team and that they're just a mirror really of, of yourself in a lot of ways that you want to either develop them to that level. Um, because I, I don't like to say that because I, I feel like a lot of times I want to bring people in or almost always where I'm learning kind of selfishly learning stuff at the same time. So I, I want some of like, like, Oh, you know, bring you up, you know, to my level. That's not, that's not really what I mean by that is that there's sort of a reciprocal learning that's happening. Do you bring like someone who knows more than me and, and, in certain areas, right? And that I, and that's that's how I can empower them and hopefully they can get the same level of value for me as a leader. Sorry to interrupt you before. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I you were, uh, do you feel like um, <clears throat> to establish trust, you have to show a little bit of weakness? And I don't mean show weakness, but I mean show humanity, like show who you are. Oh uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that first by saying that I feel like when I bring in a number two, sorry, number one, um, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend like I know everything. I'm going to, in fact, immediately declare, here's what I do know. And here's what I don't. Right. And, um, the reason I brought you in here is because you're going to fill in the gaps that I don't have that, you know, the, the things that I don't know. Okay. And I, I'm going to trust that you're going to tell me what you're doing and how you did that thing. So I can learn from you to your yep. point yep. <laughs> and you can learn from the things I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm here in this role because, you know, I've got more experience and more tenure as an IT leader, but you're in your role because you have a fresh perspective on the latest technology or, you know, all the things that you know. So yeah. I think admitting right away and sort of declaring that we are, we are thought partners, we are essentially equals in terms yeah. of the responsibility, I think yeah. is a, like one of the key steps towards building that trust. Yes, I, I completely agree. And the personal, the personal side of things, just getting to know someone, um, I almost didn't really bring that up because I almost think of that as automatic. Like in, in just in my mind, when I'm working with someone, I'm going to see every day. And I know that may not be the case for everyone, um, that when I see someone every day that I'm going to want to be able to hang out with them at work and we got to get things done and we've got to be able to trust each other. So on a more of a, I want to say a personal level, but on a, on more of a, you know, not strictly professional level that we're just, we can talk about things. We can laugh about things um, that we understand common interests and other stuff like that is especially when you're working with and you, you're building trust with it. It's a lot easier to work through the day and, and um, 
build that relationship by by creating a real a real partnership right out of the gate. Um, there so was a great- you know, it could be a few lunches. It could be you know running in the morning. It could be you know any number of things that people do to stay connected. Um, right right out of the gate and you may hire someone who doesn't have that personality too right that there's a little more uh you know just wants to come in and and leave and you've got to figure out the best way to connect uh with that person as well incidentally by the way on the topic of running i don't know if you've looked at a top-down map of where your office is versus all the cool shit around you um i have and you suck because you're literally just about a mile away from (laughs) One of the greatest um, sort of jogging pathways in Eastern Mass. So you better you better start using it. Which one is that? Uh, I'm not sure what it's called exactly, but it goes all the way from Arlington to oh, Bikeway. Yeah, yeah. Past Burlington. What's it called? It's. I think it's a, the. Is it the Miniman Bikeway? It goes all the way to Bedford from Arlington. Yes, to- maybe that's what it's called. It's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty sweet. So, I'm gonna put in the I'm gonna put not to get too off topic. But I'm gonna put in the podcast notes a link to a paper, um, on building trust that um, I showed to um when I worked at a previous company, I showed it to some executives about some some techniques they could use to build trust with people they never met before. And one of the key things they said was um, in this article, in this research paper, that uh, if you walk in a room of people you don't know and you immediately tell just a few things about yourself and or a joke, your ability to um, create trust of other people into yourself goes up by like 65%, um, some crazy number. I have to go back through it. But point is that as soon as you're willing to expose your own Weakness essentially expose your throat to another yep. person. You um, develop a sense of trust. So, yes. um, I will. I'll put the link to that paper because it's a pretty good one to read. So, Mike, as in terms of other factors, I know I said for the most critical, but yeah, um, you know, you have to. You, I mean, that person. So when Kate walks in on day one, she's got a, you know, like a hey, here's your laptop, here's your accounts, etc. Now here's this big giant list of shit we got to get done um like right away what are some other things that you need to do to get that relationship off on the right foot okay so you're going to establish trust we know that that's a key but what are some other things you're going to do right away key introductions to business partners and stakeholders introducing um kate to those to those people um baking sort of getting an introduction to the culture and how how things operate how we do so to speak in, in the organization um getting a good overview of the tool sets we have and wanting to hear certainly her opinions of what, what we have and what we can do better certainly or, or what what we don't need to do anymore it could be also um and having that open feedback loop uh for her and for her peers uh as we move forward so big thing introductions getting introductions comfortable find the right forum walk people around give people the opportunity to um give the people to walk around and meet come by and say hello um even if you can have a little bit of an event that's always a good thing find the right place to to do that um in the current situation that i'm in it's a very small company so that's pretty easy to do yeah my past companies it you know, maybe they're a bit bigger, you know, maybe by five or 10 times, that is more of an operation. So to go and make sure there are key stakeholders to help um, line up those key meetings uh, or find a key corporate event that's happening to be able to have that person plug in and socialize and and meet different different people. And if you've already got a team, sometimes you might have MSPs or vendors or other people that are in place, Make sure you do those introductory calls and connections as well to give an oversight of the vendor landscape, especially if that person may become a key contact or a primary contact for those vendors. I think it's very important to introduce the person to the entire sort of service catalog and inventory and people. So it's really introducing them to the people, the processes, and the technologies. We always say that people process technology. 
sets how do you um without without uh overloading without just sure. dumping it right it's not a dumping exercise it's a let's get a good give them time to consume and digest uh where things are at just like we talked about with our foundational plan and identifying the overall systems and tools and doing your interviews and those type of things this person being a mirror of of, of yourself and and being sort of someone who fills the gaps um needs to do some sort of the same thing you should be counseling them to feel comfortable to interact with people in the organization and getting to know them and um, you know, we, we, we talked with Kate last week and you could probably tell from and Kate, Nate knows Kate just way, way more than I do and has worked, uh, so closely with her is you can tell just from the personality that she can connect with people. And we talked about in the last episode, how important the front wheel is. And, and to me, that is, um, something that both the IT, you know, maybe the CIO and that number one need to have and I, I argue on my on my teams i think i i may even go even further and say that almost uh, everyone does yeah. uh, even your most technical backroom people it's great if they can talk to people and and have a um a good outreach a way to outreach and give trainings and and be okay connecting with people and have the ability to admit what they don't know and help where they knew, do know things that others may not know so long-winded answer, but another thing no, is, big, I, is introductions as just getting plugged in and being there to support them through those introductions, not just throwing them in the deep end of the pool. I'm excited for you. It's uh, you're getting, uh, you're getting in, in the, in the world of sort of um, acquisitions you could possibly bring on for a partner. You're getting, I think one of the best um, somebody who has really come through the ranks and uh, being a, a female technologist also not something that we're finding a lot coming up through the uh, the ranks these days. Um, so good for you. And it's going to be Thank timely you. that we're talking about this tonight because now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read the chapter and, and, sure. and you can get your drink. I'm going to tell you how to work with your partner. Sounds good. I, I've already got my drinks down here. I was, um, my wonderful wife brought down the, the stuff here and I'm, I'm good oh, to go. Isn't that excellent. Well, God bless the wives. Um, all right. So if you want to give me, hold on, let me just, before you do the, let me get my refill here. <laughs> it's not a long chapter, but it's dry in here tonight. And that it is a little dry down here in my basement. This is my operation center down here. I've got my musical stuff on that side of the room and all my work stuff on this side of the room. Yeah. I have all my musical stuff right behind me and all my work stuff behind me too. Um, <laughs> it's the it was, minute, uh, commuter, minute man commuter bikeway is the name of the, the path yes. there you go i've been trying to learn reptile on mortal Kombat, and i suck at reptile but um Finish him. it's one of those characters i never wanted to play because it just was weak and now i'm i'm just terrible at it but anyway i was trying to describe to my son mortal Kombat uh with with the family sitting there and I kind of pulled back on, on it a little bit. Uh, he was Pulling talking about spine out of their mouth. Smash, smash bros. He's like, you play smash. We're playing smash brothers. And I'm like, have you ever heard of mortal Kombat?" Uh <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, why don't you go ahead and give me the unofficial non-trademark lead in. This is audible. Bingo. Chapter seven. Sorry. I turned my head. This is how it's going to boom, boom, boom. Okay. I'll try that again. Chapter... Nice. Chapter 17, working with your partner. So you won't be able to do this without your partner. There is the truth laid bare for you. You will certainly be able to start this journey without a partner and even get some quality work done. But soon enough, you will need a partner. There's a footnote here, by the way. Somewhat cheeky footnote. If you believe this to be otherwise, you can probably skip this chapter. In fact, I should probably be reading your book instead of the other way around. 
<laughs> Indeed, you can achieve some of the IT strategic service oriented goals with an MSP or a contract hire, but in truth, they are not equipped to be a full partner to you. They do whatever you tell them or what makes them the most money. You need someone whose capabilities far exceed that of a hired help desk or template generating consultant. You need someone to bounce ideas off of at a moment's notice. You need someone who can help you quickly test access to data or stand next to a printer and send you test scans to verify a working email box. You need someone you can blindly trust to make the company's right choices and always have the company as their primary concern. You need someone else so that you can take time off. No MSP or consulting firm in the world can offer this regardless of the premium you might pay because at the end of the day, you're just a customer. Keep in mind this irrefutable fact. If there were an MSP or consulting firm that could do this, you wouldn't be there. If you are one of the very unlucky few who steps into this new role and has no budgeted headcount for year one, you must begin making a case for one. You should have clarified this in your final interviews, but if you are a bit behind in that initiative, you must start immediately. Consider the following information for making your case to the CFO. One, financial. Start with comparing the MSP's aggregate costs and any third-party consulting you need to compensate for the gaps in services. You should be able to quickly come up with anywhere from 50 to 150% of a full-time employee's salary costs. Number two, customer satisfaction. Survey data from your customers will help demonstrate that what is likely a range of unsatisfactory to very unsatisfactory for outsource help desk support. By giving employees a taste of your white glove support approach, you should be able to make a case for satisfying that delta with a full-time employee. Number three, security. To properly build a security stack and keep the focus on the other strings pulling at you, you need a body to share some of the tactical load or a third-party consulting firm. See number one to handle the work. Even then, you are still only halfway addressing the security issue since you are now creating a security gap while you're also filling a security gap. The security four, thing, sorry to interrupt you, but the security thing is big because yeah. just from a continuity perspective, a lot of times if you're doing password management and privilege access management right, you're really not sharing that with anyone else in the organization and you're the only one. And sometimes you don't want to share it with your MSP if you have one either. You Absolutely. want it to be an internal thing. If you're the only one that holds the keys to the safe, you need a number two for, for business continuity to do security right in general. Um, so that's right. the key point, I think, is that security, from a te technical perspective even, having that number two is going to help your business continuity strategy so you don't lock yourself out of all your systems. And some might say, oh, you know, I can copy that. I can save that somewhere. I can have a backup. I can give that to someone in the organization. But if that third party in the organization or in that MSP is breached, your whole company can go down. So right. you really need to have trust and transparency with your number one that can you can give the keys to the kingdom to. That's how important this person is and helps you to create the strong cybersecurity model in the process. No question that that a lot of MSPs have um, CISPs on staff yep. that can handle most security incidents. But just keep in mind that every time that you extend your security fabric outside of your company, yep. you're handing it out to somebody who could have their own security gaps, Third thereby party. doubling or tripling the amount of security gaps you're you're creating just to fill your gap. Yes. So, um, good to... point. Yes, thank you. Number Sorry. four, actions yield. In building a strategic plan, Demonstrate the delta between what you can achieve alone and what you can achieve with a second body. Number five, redundancy. The most obvious, but often most overlooked aspect of having a second person. You need someone who can be you when you are not there. Emergencies, vacations, you hit by a bus, or a former boss stealing you away. If any of these happen and there's no capable replacement ready to step in and perform all of your duties immediately, this whole adventure is pretty much for naught. The business has to pretty much start from scratch again. Armed with this data, make your case for your first hire. Back in chapter six, which was a long time ago, episode five, we already covered how you're going to take the time to consider the possible types of roles you could hire and then select the one most equipped to take on the other half of IT. 
I was somewhat coy about this before, but now let's just be blunt about it. This industry, the life sciences industry, is grossly incestuous when it comes to people switching companies because someone else made a better offer. <laughs> Do not be afraid to go after someone who you know will be ideal, regardless if they work for a prior employer or someone you know. All's fair. Well, because of your excellent <laughs> job. <laughs> Oh, Mike, I, it's all is fair, man. No, no, no. Hey, it's all good. It's no. it all works out in the end. Uh, honestly, she, she could be going to a better place. Um, <laughs> I love it. Seriously. I mean that. So, and uh, I, I, I'm a hundred percent behind it. So because of your, because of your excellent job description and your supreme recruiting and networking cap capabilities, your new partner has been hired and is ready to rock. Let's dive in. All right, creating a balancing act. First and foremost, even though you are the IT leader, you are not entitled to hoard all the fun parts of the job. I have, a, I have a footnote here. Your definition of fun could be different than mine. Maybe you enjoy <laughs> attending meetings all day and writing policies. If so, just replace the word fun with shit and do the opposite of what I say. <laughs> the truth tends to trend more in the opposite direction. While it will take time, likely stretching into years two and three, for you to fully pivot towards a primarily strategic role in the company, and you will pivot, you need to start yielding many of the tactical elements to your new partner right away. This does not mean you still won't be required to support help desk requests or build computers or administer platforms. It will take time for incidences, incidences of requests to become streamlined and ultimately reduced due to the proactive measures you both put in place. However, those elements will slowly be deprioritized from your focus as you take a more active role in planning, development, partnership, relationship building, vendor management, and other similar areas of IT growth. Striking a balance between the tactical and strategic and between you and your partner requires substantial forethought and ongoing conversation. All of these questions require an open and persistent dialogue. Be flexible with each other. If your partner needs to take a day off for a personal reason, jump right in and prioritize your schedule to accommodate. Likewise, if you need an extra pair of hands to test out something one afternoon, just ask. It won't be blissful 100% of the time, but there's a perfect chance that you will both find your rhythm. But once you both start rowing the boat simultaneously in the same direction, you will find there's little you can accomplish together. You can't accomplish together. Little you can't accomplish together. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> Sharing information. You will have all the tools in the world at your fingertips. This is one of the fringe benefits of being in IT. However, it can quickly become a curse if you do not consolidate your communications into the smallest possible footprint. Having too many communication methods can, even between two people, result in crossed wires or misunderstandings. Further, understanding when to communicate is also essential. Knowing everything from your partner's working hours to their availability to communicate on their commute to what time they prefer to go to bed and when they prefer to stop receiving normal notifications is essential to good sharing. Don't be that boss who sends an email at 9 p.m. looking for a detailed response that evening or even worse, one who says, no, no, no need to reply tonight. Have a consolidated messaging approach in place and align the types of communications you may need to share. For instance, SMS is useful for very brief questions and emergencies, but don't try to write a novel. Slack is great for conversations and quick sharing of things, but don't send an emergency message unless you are already engaged with your partner in a conversation. Email is okay for follow-up messages when you need to include someone outside of IT or as a general bulletin. Email is the last choice for emergencies, and like Slack, it can, and most likely will, have a delayed response. There are other tools out there, and you may find that a different approach works best for you and your partner, and that is fine. Just keep in mind that it should be scalable, since you will be hiring other folks as time goes on, and it should be able to be referenced in the future, should you need to go back and review a previous message. When it comes to documentation, create a centralized library of data that makes the most sense for your IT department's operations. You will have data structures private only to IT, for instance, salary data, performance assessments, et cetera, and structures that must be made public, instructional videos, 
policies, et cetera. Develop a sharing mechanism for data and your expectations for alerting your IT partner and others as needed when new documents or changes are added to previous documents. There's no acceptable reason why you and your partner should cross your wires in communication ever. Even as you grow as a department, missed communications in this day and age are unacceptable. Your partnership seriously depends on how well you get your message across to one another. Aligning goals and vision. One of the most critical aspects of building a successful partnership with your new number one is ensuring that you share a common vision and goals for the department. Having a shared understanding of where you want to take the IT department and what you hope to achieve together can help you stay aligned and work towards the same objectives, even when faced with challenges or competing priorities. When you first start working with your IT partner, take the time to sit down and discuss your long-term vision for the department. This could include topics such as, well, the role of IT in supporting the overall business strategy and goals, the key technologies and initiatives you want to focus on in the coming years, the desired culture and values of the IT department, and the metrics and success criteria you will use to measure progress and impact. Having an open and honest conversation about these topics ensures that you and your partner are on the same page and are working towards a shared vision for the future of IT within your organization. In addition, in addition to a long-term vision, it's also important to establish shared goals and objectives on a more tactical level. This could include setting specific targets for projects, initiatives, or key performance indicators that you want to achieve together. By breaking down your larger vision into smaller achievable goals, you can create a sense of shared purpose and accountability and celebrate successes together. But when setting goals and objectives, make sure to involve your IT partner and seek their input and feedback. This helps ensure that the goals are realistic and achievable, and it fosters a sense of ownership and commitment from both people. Regularly review progress against those goals and adjust them as needed, ensuring you remain aligned and focus on the most important priorities. Another key aspect of aligning goals and vision is effective communication. Establish regular check-ins and status updates with your IT partner, where you can discuss progress, challenges, and opportunities. This can include weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings, team meetings, or even informal coffee chats. By maintaining open and frequent communication, you can ensure that you both stay informed and engaged and quickly address any issues or concerns. Finally, it's important to remember that aligning goals and vision is an ongoing process, not a one-time event. As the business evolves and new priorities emerge, regularly revisit and update your shared goals and objectives, ensuring they remain relevant and aligned with the organization's overall direction. By continuously working together to refine and adapt your vision and goals, you can build a strong, resilient, resilient partnership that can weather any storm and drive long-term success for your IT department and the business. Providing opportunities and fostering growth. Your partner is a wonderful resource both to you and the business. This is someone who can back you up at a moment's notice and essentially be you when you cannot be available. So why not do your best to provide them all the opportunities possible to shape them into becoming you? I do not mean you as a human blob of goo with all your imperfections. I mean you as the IT leader of a growing company. In my career, I have seen often enough to be disturbing IT leaders overtly inhibiting their employees from progressing up the ladder as a means of securing their position. They create a moat around their role that no one can cross. And so what happens as a net result? Well, acrimony develops. People leave. And those who do secure a role close to the leader will create their own moats because they're oh so insecure about their own positions. Don't be that IT leader. Instead, be the IT leader who advocates for their partner on an evangelical scale. Work with your partner to create opportunities for leadership and growth at every turn. Why not have your partner lead the facility move project? Why not have your partner form up and lead the information security committee? Where is it written that you need to teach all these things? You don't. They can. Focus right. on your partner's strengths and find ways to utilize those strengths in other business areas. There's a balance that needs to be established here too. Creating and providing opportunities for leadership and participation is a critical element of leadership development. Your executive team cannot fully understand IT scope as a competency until they can see all of IT at work and not just hear your diluted song and dance week after week. <laughs> <laughs> if you have an upcoming infrastructure initiative kicking off, have the person doing the work 
i.e. your partner, lead the discussion. Further, don't just feed your partner to the lions. Work with them to help them make a fantastic presentation. Perhaps do a few dry runs with some Q&A type grilling and then get them in front of the executive team. This is an excellent opportunity for both of you. On the one hand, you are showing the executive team that you made an awesome hiring decision for your partner. On the other hand, after your partner nails that presentation, your channels will open up for them, allowing them to forge and develop their relationships with the executive team independently. Opportunities abound when it's just the two of you and you are responsible for sharing. No one will think you are no longer the IT leader if you are not leading everything. Your paranoia is entirely out of context. Succession planning in IT is such a taboo subject and for no good reason that I've ever been able to discern. On the flip side, you may find that your partner wants nothing to do with your role. You may find that your partner loves to be hands-on and tactical every day, and that sitting in meetings and becoming a policy wonk is anathema to their IT dreams. That does not mean to strip them of opportunity either. Again, Stressing the importance of balance means their opportunities should be more finely tuned to their career aspirations. Perhaps they don't want to lead the entire IT department, but they want to lead a technical architecture team. So provide them with the opportunities that will make them amazing in that role. Furthermore, as the IT leader, one of your key responsibilities is to support the professional growth and development of your team members, including your partner. By investing in their skills, knowledge, and expertise, you not only help them to achieve their full potential, but also strengthen the overall capabilities and success of your whole department. There are a few ways you can do this. First, continuous learning. In today's rapidly evolving technology landscape, continuous learning is essential for staying ahead of the curve and delivering value to the organization. Encourage your partner to prioritize their professional development and seek opportunities to expand their skills and knowledge. This could include attending industry conferences, especially local ones, workshops, training sessions where they can learn about the latest trends, best practices, and emerging technologies in their field. Many professional associations such as IEEE, ACM, or ISACA offer many learning resources and events to help your partner stay up to date and connected with their peers. In addition to external learning opportunities, consider hosting internal training sessions or workshops where your partner and future team members can share their expertise and learn from one another. This helps build a culture of continuous learning within your department and fosters great collaboration and knowledge sharing among the IT team members. Another valuable way to support your IT partner's professional growth is by encouraging them to pursue relevant certifications in their field. Certifications validate your partner's skills and knowledge and demonstrate their commitment to excellence and continuous improvement. Popular certifications include uh, CompTIA certifications such as A+, Network+, and Security+, Cisco certifications such as CCNA, CCNP, and CCIE, Microsoft certs, MCSA, MCSC, and MCSD, ITIL certs, Foundation Practitioner and Expert, AWS Certified Professionals, and Project Management certs such as PMP and PRINCE2. Work with your partner to identify the certs that align with their career goals and your organization's needs and provide them with the necessary resources and support to pursue these credentials. I would also add, though I didn't write this, provide them with the time. This could include covering the cost of training materials, exam fees, or study, oh, well, there it is, or study time, or even offering bonuses or promotions for achieving certain certifications. In addition to learning, in addition, in addition to formal learning opportunities, consider providing your IT partner with ongoing mentoring and coaching to support their professional growth. This can include regular one-on-one -on -one sessions where you provide guidance, feedback, and advice on their career development and help them to navigate challenges and opportunities within the organization. You can also encourage your partner to seek out mentors or coaches outside of your immediate team, such as other IT leaders within the company or even external mentors from professional associations or industry groups. By building a diverse network of support and guidance, your partner can gain valuable insights and perspectives to help them grow and succeed. Finally, consider providing your IT partner with stretch assignments and leadership opportunities that allow them to take on new challenges and responsibilities. This could include leading a major project or initiative, presenting to senior leadership or external stakeholders, or taking on a temporary role in another department function. By pushing your partner outside of their comfort zone, and allowing them to demonstrate their skills and potential, 
you can help them build confidence, credibility, and visibility within the organization. This supports their growth and development and helps position them for future leadership roles and opportunities. Building yourself through leadership and trust. Many corporate leaders have their favorite leadership quotes and aphorisms that they like to post in their LinkedIn bio or spout off in conversation. I will spare you the triteness of any leadership quotes because building yourself into an IT leader requires skills you either have or don't have. All of the world's quotes won't matter if you are simply just an insecure narcissist who feeds off of control. Good IT leaders are imbued with capabilities to make mistakes, admit that they made them, learn from them, and better themselves and those around them when they do. Good IT leaders also know that sometimes they have to get under a desk and just fix the damn printer. Since you will be the only person in IT on day one, you have no choice but to lead off and set the example in doing every task. Furthermore, once your IT partner joins, this remains still mostly true for a while. You are, after all, their backup to all tasks in as much as they are to yours. They may have specific tasks for which they are primarily responsible, but you should always be willing to roll up your sleeves as needed. Pay attention because here's the tricky part. Always maintain this willingness. Indeed, you should recognize that people are better equipped to handle specific department tasks than you. After all, that's why you hired them. So stand back, let the experts do the work, but never ask them to do something that you would not gladly and willingly do yourself. Now this covers more than tactical hands-on tasks. This covers the breadth of all IT responsibilities. Who is the first person who should be willing to take watch for an overnight project? Who is the first person who should be willing to drop everything and work over a weekend on a serious issue? Who is the first person who should be ready to embrace a new cultural standard? Who is the person who should be packing up boxes and crawling their desks to disconnect monitors when it comes time to move? The answer is you. It's always you. However, your head of infrastructure won't want you to even think about touching the core switches for the network upgrade. Just because you break everything you touch doesn't mean you can't check in over the weekend, provide copious amounts of food and beer, or even offered to come by just to be there. Just don't touch the switches. As corny and cliche as it sounds, staying true to IT's roots is how you will build yourself as a leader and prove that you are trustworthy. All of the classes, audiobooks, and analyst consultations in the world won't make you a good IT leader if you don't also put those things into practice. They may augment what you what, what you already have, but it is essentially comes down to essentially comes down to your ability to lead by example and do the right things day in and day out. Your partner's ability, as well as that of the business and your IT department, to trust you will evolve, will evolve from this. Being genuine, open, honest, and willing is essential for building trust, not dictating from the ivory throne. As a good friend of mine and an esteemed IT leader once put it, don't ever lose the street when you become an IT leader. To that end, as you mature and evolve into a fantastic IT leader on your own, Stay true to these core tenets. Know everything that's happening in IT at all times, yet ask questions on things you don't understand. Your partner and staff know that you generally know what's going on, but they also know that you don't know every technical detail, so don't pretend like you do. Don't make it yourself out to be something bigger than your staff. Everyone should be able to have an opinion. Each opinion should carry the same weight. Sometimes things just have to be done your way, but not always. So actively seek their opinions. Give credit where credit is due. Never, ever put your name on something that somebody else on your staff completed. Go to the ends of the earth to ensure that everyone knows how cool that thing was and who did it. Admit when you screw up and share what you learned from the experience with others. Your experiences carry value to your partner and staff. Stand up for everyone in your department. Never let one of your staff take a direct hit, even if they deserved it. No matter what, at the end of the day, it's your fault that they screwed up. Ask for feedback continuously. Your partner and staff should feel that they can give you feedback without any fear of recrimination. Then act on the feedback and improve yourself. And possibly the most important of them all, be the first to come and the last to leave. This applies to everything, including the bar. And on that note, never, ever let your staff pay for a meal or drinks. You are the one making the big bucks, 
not them. Managing conflicts and maintaining a healthy partnership. So even in the strongest partnerships, conflicts and disagreements are inevitable. As you work closely with your IT partner, there may be times when you have different opinions, priorities, or approaches to a particular issue. The key to maintaining a healthy and productive working relationship is to address these conflicts constructively and proactively. To do this, there are several key things you can do. One of the most important, of course, as we've already stated, is maintaining open and honest communication. When a disagreement does arise, create a safe and non-judgmental space where both of you can freely express your thoughts and concerns. Avoid becoming defensive or dismissive, and instead, focus on understanding your partner's perspective and the underlying reasons behind their position. Further, encourage your partner to share their ideas and opinions, even if they differ. By fostering an open dialogue and mutual respect environment, you can often uncover new insights and solutions you may have yet to consider. In addition to expressing your thoughts and opinions, it's equally important to practice active listening when managing conflicts. This means fully focusing on your partner's words and body language and seeking to understand their perspective before responding. Avoid interrupting or jumping to conclusions. Instead, ask clarifying questions to ensure you completely understand their position. Paraphrase their key points to confirm you accurately capture their thoughts and feelings. Demonstrating genuine curiosity and empathy can very quickly diffuse tensions and create a more collaborative and solutions-oriented atmosphere. When conflicts arise, it's important to remember that the goal is not to win the argument, but to find a solution that works for both parties and the organization. This often requires a willingness to compromise and find common ground. So start by identifying where you and your partner agree and use that as a foundation for building a shared solution. Look for ways to incorporate your perspectives and priorities and be open to creative or unconventional approaches. If you do reach an impasse, consider bringing in a third party such as a trusted colleague or mentor, to help facilitate the conversation and provide an objective perspective. Working together to find a mutually co acceptable compromise can actually strengthen your partnership and build greater trust and resilience. But even in the heat of conflict, it's always essential to maintain a sense of respect and professionalism towards your IT partner. Avoid personal attacks, sarcasm, or other hostile behaviors that can damage your relationship and undermine your ability to work together effectively. Instead, Focus on the issues and behaviors, not the person, and express your concerns calmly and constructively. If emotions do run high, consider taking a break or postponing the conversation until both parties can relax and reflect. Finally, it's important to regularly check in with your partner and assess the health and effectiveness of your relationship. This could include setting aside time for regular one-on-one -on -one meetings, discuss your shared goals and projects, and any concerns or tensions that may be brewing beneath the surface. If you did your job right, your partner should be an essential, as essential and trustworthy to the business at the end of your first three years as you are. They will have depth and responsibility that extends beyond their role, and the two of you should have an almost meta connection when it comes to supporting the growth of the business in IT. It is your responsibility to make this happen. As much as you have every right to set high expectations for your partner, they have exactly the same right to set the bar equally high for you. Imagine what you and your partner can accomplish together. Now go do it. Chapter 17 Summary Key Takeaways An IT partner is essential for the long term success of the IT department and the company. An MSP or consulting firm cannot provide the same level of dedication and trust. If an IT partner's headcount is not budgeted, make a strong case to the CFO by highlighting the financial, customer satisfaction, security, and redundancy benefits of having a full time employee. Create a balance between tactical and strategic responsibilities, gradually shifting more tactical tasks to your partner while focusing on planning, relationship building, and vendor management yourself. Establish open and persistent communication with your partner, being flexible and accommodating to each other's needs and schedules. Provide opportunities for your partner to lead projects, present to the executive team, and develop their skills and relationships within the organization. Support their professional growth through continuous learning, certifications, mentoring, and stretch assignments. Lead by example. Be willing to take on any task, admit mistakes, get credit where it's due, and stand up for your whole team. And by the end of your first three years, your partner should be as essential and trustworthy to the business as you are. Pro tips. 
Who makes the best partner? Most likely it's someone you already know and trust. So go after them, Mike. Worst case scenario, you can't hire them because their current company is too afraid to lose them and just up their salary and title. Think of ways to extract the maximum publicity from your partner's work and put those on center stage for the company to see. A diverse and inclusive team not only reflects the broader society in which we live, but also brings a wide range of perspectives, experiences, and skills to the table, which can drive innovation, creativity, and problem solving. Research has shown that diverse and inclusive teams outperform homogenous teams on various metrics, including financial performance, employee engagement, and customer satisfaction. Some of the key benefits of diversity and inclusion include improved decision-making, greater innovation, enhanced employee engagement, stronger customer relationships, and positive employer brand. Here are some additional ways you can work with your IT partner to foster a welcoming, inclusive environment. So yourself, model inclusive behavior. Provide diversity and inclusion training. Celebrate diversity. Foster open communication and address bias and discrimination head on. In terms of hacks, well, the only real hack here concerns non-solicit agreements in the life sciences industry. They are complete and utter bullshit. And far too often, employees are bullying and signing them after they are already employed or suspected of potentially leaving. You don't have to sign a non-solicit agreement unless the employer requires you to do so to get the job. If you are already employed, it's too late. You are made to believe you need to sign them through aggressive language and Machiavellian tactics. Often they come with some sort of financial incentive, which itself is also generally bullshit. Non-competes are a little non-competes are a little bit more challenging and harder to enforce. So non-solicits have become the new and terrible normal. In either case, before signing a non-solicit or non-compete, seek the advice of a lawyer and strive to amend the language in your favor. Take note of how the company deals with you in getting this advantage, which will tell you your employer's true nature. So what's the hack here? Well, when you as the IT leader go to steal your IT partner from a former employer, they or you may have already been forced to sign one of these agreements. So you have to be a little bit more covert than usual when hiring them away. There are ways around all of it. and Every state approaches it differently. Do your homework. By the way, I'm not advocating for violating non-solicit agreements, even though I am. Things to watch out for. So over the last 25 plus years, I've taken many of my leadership cues from both good and bad leaders. And these cues have formed the foundation of the leadership skills I have today. I have watched IT leaders badger employees and build departments fueled by spite. I've seen IT leaders who knew so little about IT and they built departments by regurgitating every detail and following every step from so-and-so analyst firm. Even with all the management courses, consortia, books, and conferences, the most significant takeaways were always what I learned by watching other leaders and adding what I thought were their best elements to my overall style. While every bad IT leader has shown me a crystal clear path to what never to do, every good IT leader has shown me the breadth of what's possible, especially with their partners. Could I do everything to emulate those I consider effective or successful leaders? Of course not. What made them special was how they hooked all those same elements to their career and combine them in their unique way to create unique departments. However, through all of this, there's one theme I have discovered to be true and universally applicable. Good leaders, especially good IT leaders, can be identified by their department strength, the character of their partner, and their willingness to roll up their sleeves to get their work done. Also, be humble and recognize that you couldn't be where you are today without the work of everyone who works for you. Yes, you certainly did a lot of work to get to this point in your career, but truthfully, you did it all on the backs of your partner and your staff. That's it. Well read. Thank you. I, just reading that, I had like a thousand things I wanted to say as asides. I had to bite my tongue on. But just going back to that again, I... I feel so strongly about this moment in, in evolution of a growing company. Yeah. It is a big freaking deal. It is um, a pretty big deal. 
and you know it like you, you can't you can't screw it up yeah uh, if you bring in a a partner <laughs> they're terrible you're screwed yeah it's difficult and there's you got to get creative <laughs> Let's face that's uh that's the there's no there's no uh oops, I made a mistake. Yeah. If that if that happens, you've got to get creative with how you can best utilize that person and yeah and figure out where they where they fit. And if they don't, then you have some unpleasant uh work to do to figure out how to move on. So what do you think about I mean, geez, where do you even start? So what do you think about the 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 seating of the of the tactical responsibilities? So you and I were both hands-on people. Yeah, sure. And I'll be the first one to dive under a desk to fix a issue. Yeah. Uh, when it needs to be fixed, right? Because I until I have a very large department or something or something very tactically efficient, I'm just I can't stand by to watch something so easily fixable be broken. Yep. But we're also heads <laughs> of IT. So, there's, you know, you, you got to start also being serious too about, about your other side of the, of the, the role. So like, where do you, where do you start seeding the tactical Mike? Like, how do you, how do you begin to pro begin that process? Cause here in this chapter, I advocate it's almost right away. And I, I do believe in that. You mean sort um, of moving away from the technical stuff? Is yeah. So like uh, when your number two shows up, or number one shows up on day one and you're like, okay, I have this list. Yeah. Here's all the things that I, I can't do because they're taking up my time. I need to focus on these other bigger things. Like, so here's this list for you. Yeah. Um, is it right then and there? Like that's what it would be. That's what it was for me. Yeah. I think this, that's an opportunity for that person to take it and make it theirs the way they want to do it. The way, the reason they've been hired is to um, figure out the best path forward. You're only able to do so much on your own in a small organization when you come in. And there's often, as is the case in my case as well, so many things that I've got to wait till I have a number one to really move on these things as, together with that number one. Yeah. Like, I'm, and I, back to that security point, you know, I made earlier, it's not just security, but it's fault tolerance for any system you put in place. So if anything doesn't work out and you're not right there to, to fix it every time, that that's not going to be a good customer experience if you let that go on too long. Yeah. So when, in my current organization, there's a lot of change management right now. We're changing systems. We're moving to new systems. And there's one person right now who's not just trying to lead the change management, but yeah. also do it and turn turn the knobs and and configure it and go through the validation and go management through basically doesn't work with one person. I mean, I, I learned that might like exactly. So right out of the gate, it's what here is low hanging fruit for you that you're interested in or that you can jump on right away. And I think a lot of times people come in and I, this is the case at Carex and the Kibia for me as well is I, I know how to do this. Let me have it. Let's go. And it's like, great. Let's go. Let's follow up next week and see where you're at, and we'll we'll figure out if it's the right approach, you know, for for the company and for you. Because I don't want also want people to take something and they spend all the time on it, and now they don't have the time to look at the other things that they want to look at. Um, that you're kind of just throwing them in the deep end of the pool, and they're getting overwhelmed. You yeah. you want to be able to check back in with them and see if it's working out for them and for the company to be spending so much time on one of these initiatives. So. That's the open communication loop and being able to connect. But I'm very much someone who um, my last three roles has been, this is your thing. I, I want to know as much about it and learn as much about it as I can. Yeah. But you, you you own this and you you this is this is all yours. You, you will get all the the kudos, you know, when, when it is successful. And um I'm just here to support you as best I can. I'm here to listen. I'm here to get you connected. I'm here to help you with any of the existing technical debt that we have and uh, get you through that. And I'm here to help you grow and let them go and, and get things moving right out of the gate, right away, you know, to, if they're comfortable with that. Some want 
you know, I've had people come in and like, give me a couple weeks here just to take a deep breath and see, you know, there's a lot of stuff here to do. And others who are like, that is low hanging fruit. I can start on that right away. Yeah. I, I, I'm on that. Uh, we'll, we'll just go for it and see immediate returns on, on a technical change that we can make with someone who has that experience. So, so very quickly, I would say is my answer. So let's go back to that kudos moment that you just mentioned. Um, I know I talked about this in here, giving credit where credit is due to, to a degree, but like, uh, so it's my belief and you can, uh, I think you're probably going to agree with this is my belief that when uh, your partner does something amazing uh, or anyone in your department does something amazing that you tell everybody that this person did this thing. Like I, um, yeah. Hey everybody, look at this awesome thing that this person did uh, totally on their own. Uh, unsupervised, all themselves. Like it's changing the company. Here's the game changing effect of it. Um, yeah. But I like to give them the opportunity, you know, see if you've got a larger team or you've built it out to also present it. Hey, what, come come to the team meeting. Let's let's let you go through it and show everyone how you did it. And because that's an opportunity for them to present and really put out there. For example, my last company, a uh, few, few, few times, um, actually many, many times had, people present at the org wide, like a uh, GNA meeting or the finance meeting. And we would pick a implementation or something that someone had done. And that number one person, whether it was the number one person in GNA or the number one person in R and D or, or uh, in commercial, for example, in IT, they would, they would go and give the overview. Here's what we did. Here's, here's how things went great. And here's the capability build that we have. And here are things that we learned. Uh, for next time and it gave them an opportunity to be out front and get exposure okay. and it, with a smaller team where you just got two people right it's let's do that at the management meeting let's do that at the executive level let's do that give people all the ability to 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 kind of expose their their good deeds and the things that they've been able to implement and and they they really deserve all of the attention and credit for those things um, you're really there to, the, the bigger your team gets, the more you are there to coach and lead them and develop them yeah. and build them. And, uh, you know, the last eight to 10 years of, of my life, that's what I've tried to really hone in on is I can sit down here in the basement and, and play with all the technologies and the toys, uh, on my own dime and mess around with those things. When I go to work, my job is to, to build and foster the team and to move things forward and to learn from them as much as I can, that's what I like to do <laughs> for the most part for my own personal benefit is, is to really help whoever you bring in, let them get on the, that career ladder that they're already on and keep taking those rungs and moving out. Whether it means they stay in IT, they move into the business or they go to a new company. Yeah. Um, it's really, you really want to, and, and those connections will remain connections long after they're gone. If you do that and your legacy will be better in the longer run, I think, in terms of where you've left companies when you leave and the culture you've created and will help you with the next job you have. So this is, uh, it's this important is a topic stuff. that is, sorry to interrupt you. Oh, go but, ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, this is a topic that um, is also near and dear to me. I, I, I try to develop every employee of mine in IT for the next role. Yeah. Uh, not just the current role, but for the next role. Yep. So yeah. when I have those competitions, it's okay. Like what's next for you? Oh, you want to be a so-and-so. Okay. Well, right now you're this and we probably don't have so-and-so here, but let's go ahead and pretend that we're going to get you for the next company. Like I, I want to get you through this onto your next company to do that role. Um, I don't mind losing great talent yep. as much as it hurts because I've enabled that person to get to the next level of their career. Yep. Which I think is that's individual development to too. That they have those goals, that they you help them build those if they don't have them or make them think about it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, certainly I'm going to that's a two way thing. They, they, want, they want to have to want to develop too. Like you can they, you can they do. Them, but you've got to you've got to have that, you know, I think you'll you'll wean that out when you hire people is people who want to grow and they're 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 really gonna take the things that whether they have done them before or they haven't, and they're going to want to experience them and they're going to want to learn them. And 
the, it just gets farther and farther away from what technology do you know? What systems do you know? Right. And it's more about how do you consume information and how do you connect with people? And because the data is out there, the tools are out there, the trainings, the certifications are out there. Being able to connect and speak to a room or to be able to lead people or to manage people or to be part of a company where people want to to really work with you and, and they trust you, is is it's hard to teach that skill. And that's more and more as uh, an IT and across a, a lot of different organizations. I, I think that's where like, that's kind of something you have to have coming in the door. Uh, you got to wean that out in the interview process. I agree. And I mean, development of your number one is, and this is my take and I wrote it in here. Development number one is, is key. It's, like, it's, it's a critical element like I, my, I'm bringing my number one in because they're super strong at a bunch of things, mm -hmm. but I also right out of the gate want to begin the process of accelerating their transformation in, uh, you know, areas X, Y, and Z, let's say, right. And yeah. so as part of this, it's going to, it's going to be, okay, listen, I'm so glad that you're here. Here's this big giant pile of things we're going to do. We have to get our, you know, we have all these projects we're going to work on together. And oh, by the way. You also need to go get certified in X, Y, and Z uh, certifications. You need to take these classes and go to this thing and do this because your training is key. And it's difficult, I think, for a number one to come in and be like, okay, here's this list of things you just gave me to do. Here's these certs you want me to get. And I also have my personal life. So how do I sort of balance that? And right. I'll be honest, like for me, it's always the struggle has been more because i work in like the the companies i work for have a lesser chance of survival yeah than perhaps somebody who's working in a more stable company so i need to get my number ones in up to speed trained certified ready to go for the next job as, as in the shortest period of time like two years and um but my whole my whole goal is to get that person just pushing forward. Like, okay, you come in at this level. If I've done my job, you'll leave here at the next level. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But when it comes when it comes to developing your number one, and this is development now, what do you put as sort of like the top priority for uh -huh. their development? Some of it is it's just overall leadership. Um, I think that's a big a big part of it is, uh, and I, I think in in the case of or current in is already there, right? So that's a that's an important thing. But uh, I would say that just the overall leadership training, if you need be, like my my approach in certifications and other stuff is a little different. I I'm not a huge, um, I don't push those as hard. I, I don't think I think I if someone comes into the organization. I almost expect them to tell me what certifications they need. Yeah. I, I'm not, um, and, and a lot of times if they're coming in as an expert in a certain area, they know uh, what what certifications they need or want. Uh, I might be behind on that. <laughs> That's one of no, the just, things uh... I learned from. You. So I, a lot of times what I'll say is like, what, what do you, what do you want to learn? I, I've, I've hired you and I trust that you know what you know. And you wouldn't be here if if you need to go and get a bunch of certifications and what I hired you for. I, I think I'm more of like, what do you want to learn for your next role? And I can help you with that. That's but the for your, for your current role, uh, not 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 as much. But for the next role, it really depends on what their what their what their aspiration is and what what role they want next. Do they like we talked a little bit earlier? Do you want to be a CIO, or do you want to be more of a, an individual contributor? And, and technical expert, do you want to move into the business and be more focused on you know, clinical development? You want to move into science? Um, and it depends on, and, and that number one that you bring in could be interested in all sorts of different things. It, it doesn't just have to be IT or be a management track. Um, so it depends on that. And I think technically, uh, if there are certs required, I, I think it's only in the case of when we're much, 
if they want to get them, that is great. But only in the case that we become much larger and more complex, where there there is a requirement for certs, or um, where there's a, a need uh, ultimately to to get a system in that we weren't ready to implement and we don't have the resource for. So somebody's got to go and learn it very quickly. Um, more of a tactical uh, um, decision to be made yes. there. But when someone comes in and says, like, I've had people in the past who've been very interested in a certain area, they they usually come to me and say, this is the conference I need to go to. Um, this is the cert I want. Um, this is what I've seen before in this space. And I'm interested in this. And we do it. We look at it together and we go through it. And because we're going to we're going to invest in this person, right? we're gonna invest in this and to think about where, where it fits and if it fits. But 99% of the time, it's let's figure out how we can work it into the schedule. So you're not having to do this at night when you get home. You can do, have the time during the day to focus and develop yourself. And I think one of the things that's sometimes difficult is, especially the small organization, you know you don't have that role available, right? You know, you know that maybe you're not you're not going to have that role, um, just because it's not the air because their interest lies maybe lies outside the the organization's um, sort of open positions or whatnot, is to continue to develop them anyway, and to to uh, let them know over beer if they see something that interests them uh, somewhere else that you'll support them. Uh, right. right. Not not all not all companies like to hear you that you're doing that, but yeah, I, I think the great I think the great companies and the and the good companies they do, they want their employees to go on to brighter and greater things. It's great to keep them and retain them, but if they have a personal opportunity to go to the moon, for example, they should go. And good companies uh, will influence and drive people to get the best out of their people while they're there, but also that they have a a better life as a result. They don't get pigeonholed or locked into something that they they burn out. And then 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 the company gets a better reputation, right? You're 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 in the you get burned out and you know you don't get an opportunity to develop yourself. That that doesn't look good. Uh nope. the next person coming in. Totally agree. Um so I I made the I made the argument both for and against this in the chapter, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. So I have hired uh a number one before in a previous company a superstar um brilliant in many many respects mm -hmm. who uh i think on day two or three said i will i never want your role mm -hmm. yeah and um said i'm i'm i want i never want to go past here i always want to be number one yeah i never want to be you and i tried every possible thing i could to convince this person that there were benefits to this role um but i couldn't also hide the fact that i got frustrated sometimes mm -hmm. and that i had choice words for certain people in my organization about their decision making and just you know frustrations we're human beings right frustrations come out it's frustrating and, and uh, he would say you you how can you ask me why i don't want your role um okay i don't have to deal with this you shield me from this so um i've heard that i've heard that that phrase before yeah yeah um air cover man air cover air cover exactly so so in terms of uh hiring somebody as a number one who does not want your job yep. you still i i think again and i hold this to, i hold this belief that yep. even if they don't want your job you want to train them to be you anyway. You still want to train them to be the top spot because A, you could have a heart attack and die and they need to do it anyway. Yep. And, and or B, I mean, just kidding aside, succession planning is part of your goal. Like you yeah, as an absolutely, absolute leader, absolutely. Succession planning is like right up there in the top five. And no one likes to admit it, but there it is. But also how cool is it how freaking cool is it when somebody that you took the time to work with and build becomes a head of IT one day? And I've got so many people that worked for me that became heads of IT that are just killing it. That, 
<laughs> and that see see to me that's that, that's where, that's, oh that's probably the most important thing we've done. Absolutely. So that's, is the fact that all we've my had, accomplishments are nothing compared to that. I, and I think that's a, a good aspiration for a first IT leader is to be in a position where the people that have come to work for you are now doing, you know, what we continue to do. Uh, I want to work for them. I want to be know, a number one for once. I, 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 uh, I, I completely hear you and I'm so proud of, um, I mean, especially a, a few of the people that I worked with in my last, my last job that have gone on to be heads of IT. Um, cool is that, man? Just, I can, I mean, just in the last eight years, I can think of five. Yeah. So and it's just it's insane. And, and, and they're all doing great and they're, and they're yeah. confident and they're, they're, they all have different approaches. They're all different leaders. I just, I just think it's really, it is really cool that, you know, there's so many people that we've touched to be able to move into these bigger roles and that we've had a, some, hopefully had some small impact yeah. <laughs> on, on, I mean, I, on that happen for them, which is I don't know how often you get to talk to your um, former colleagues, but I get to see mine at least once a year at dinner. And we yep. talk, we talk on the line sometimes and I get to hear their stories and, you know, they send me notes like, Hey, Nate, like, what, what would you do in this case? And I'm like, Oh, remember that time when, and Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and, and that's it. That's all I have to do. I'm like, remember that time I had I did the same thing, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, so make a choice. I can go, the, can go that way, or can go another way that you think of that I haven't thought of. Um, but yeah, I, I just so in terms of the people that don't want to be number one, I think that the key is that you still have to train them because yeah. a, they might change their opinion one day. Sure, they might be in a position they can't get out of. But yeah. you know, still train them and be the number one, even if they're like no freaking way. Um, by the way, I want to lean on the on the some of the, and, and I know for you and I this is fun. If there's someone who's wants to be that individual contributor and not the 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 head honcho, so to speak, or uh, kind of the the top of the top of the the chain, or from a management perspective, um, that they can we can we can in, kind of in, inject the technology stuff you know is there ai and security and i mean i've had a number of uh i like think of maybe three people who in my past recently who are who are in that boat right they don't want they don't want to be a cio and they are like what else can i do and i i I think the need for a technical job ladder, just like we have scientific scientists that are on job ladders and they're individual contributors at a lot of the companies we've worked for, that having a technical job ladder that's not a management job ladder, that's more of a, a, a horizontal and growth uh, jo a job ladder that allows people to know more and learn more in their specific technical area and become specialists and experts. Um, they're consulted by everyone, right? Yeah. I mean, there's there's a huge a huge uh, market for for people who are architects, uh, enterprise architects, security architects, Boy. information security experts uh, more than ever for data analysts and data architects, um, and there's just so in, in in our field in technology, there's just so many ways you can go. Yeah. And there are, I think there are a lot of, in, in software companies, I know for a fact, there are a lot of in, individual contributors who make more money than managers. Oh, well, absolutely. And, and and I mean, that's, that's, that's cool. Um, there's, I know back with the big security boom, you know, 2018 to now, pretty much 2017, where it's like, oh my goodness, we got to find a security person. Like, some of these these um, software companies who are hiring people making more than the CEO on a salary. So I mean, there's 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 I'm not saying that may be the case now. Maybe that's not the case today. But people who don't want to be the head of IT, um, whatever you can do as a leader to get them close to people, whether they're peers at your company or someone who's not at your company. Yeah. You mentioned conferences and communities and. And and ways to plug in people with other people that are have already or where these people want to be, yeah. Uh, 
that just it's huge and that that will get them even if they're they don't want to be the leader they come to work every day they know they're going to get exposed to some of those things that they really want to do um and when budgets are tight sometimes it's hard you got to get creative to how you get people uh into the things they want to do and the meetups is like we talked about meetups um before a couple episodes ago getting people comfortable with just socializing and learning uh, in kind of informal settings that aren't company based um there's just so many things out there that good managers can plug people into including our podcast you know come on our podcast and let's talk let's do it, um, let's do it. and yeah. um get on the discord you know and we'll share some ideas the whole all the people that are joining hopefully here <laughs> we'll, we'll share some ideas and and talk about our digital quandaries i i have to go back a long way in my career to find a leader uh, where, where I had to find a case where my leader was not uh, CFO or president. I have to go all the way back to 2003, where it was the last time I had, um, where, where my boss was a the head of IT. Yeah. Um, and I, and then even then I only had ever had two bosses that were heads of IT um, over a eight year span. Yep. And, you know, I learned a lot of great lessons from both of those leaders. I will tell you this, that, and I wrote this in the book because I felt it was important to include and even include on its own was that Matt, Matt taught me one lesson that I'll never forget. And I, I didn't realize at the time, and I've told Matt this too, and every time we, we sort of get together, but that he always paid, mm -hmm. paid for everything. Yep. And it was, I mean, this wasn't like uh, he was making tons and tons of cash. He he always paid though. Like we would put our credit cards in, you know, to the pot or, you know, throw in a 20 or something, but he always swallowed the bullet in terms of paying for everything we did. And yeah. I remember that. And, um, and then I carried forward into this day, I still pay for my staff, <laughs> even people that don't work for me anymore. Because in truth, I would not be uh, a CIO. I would not be leading IT departments. I would not be doing anything I'm doing without all the bullshit and all the things I made my teams do over the years, all the crazy wackadoodle chat plans I had, every vision I've ever had, nothing I could have ever accomplished without my folks beneath yeah. me. Yep. And so that yep. one thing I called out, in fact, I was just like, I, I used to, when I first wrote the book, it was like this, this huge one whole page was that one, one phrase. But I want to reemphasize that um, your people should never, ever pay for a drink or for a meal. Take care uh, of it. Under your employee. And, you know, you want to, you know, after they leave and go on and become super successful, then maybe they can pay once. Yep. Even then, it's probably not right. But, I, I tend to do that in so many different circumstances as if someone is uh whether it's just a personal relationship or it's a or a, or a team that sometimes that's especially with the team there's just it should be an automatic thing for for yeah. twice about that and in terms of a lot of times it, it's just it's automatic and I realize that it may not be for everyone so I I do I do think that whenever you do something with a team, you need to be present. You said the first one to get there, the last one to leave. Um, be there for the whole thing. I know sometimes you have to leave or something might come up that you have to go be somewhere else for whatever reason, but make the best effort to uh, to be there and to talk to as many people on the team as, as you can. I mean, I know, um, you know, right when you've got a smaller team, it's easier, but when you get a, a bigger team, it's like, you really want to make sure you give the face time to, to everyone and that you can have fun. And whether you're mini golfing or you're at the bar or whatever it might be that you, you're getting to spend some time with everyone. Yeah. If you're traveling together, you know, if you're traveling with a few people on your team, that's sometimes the, the best time to, to connect because you see everyone that, Oh different points of their of their of their <laughs> Garden of 2014 
13, 14, 15. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think I dropped like four grand each year on steak dinners and best scotches for my team and everything I could possibly buy. Um, and it's dropping the bucket. I mean, it was like the least I could do for, for those folks. Yeah. To show my appreciation and, and still to this day, it wasn't enough, you know, it was, uh, it was like, whatever, whatever you want, like it's yours, you know? And because honestly, like I have five times as much equity as you do. My salary is twice yours. Like whatever you want. Exactly. Let's do this. And that's, I mean, that's a lot of times it's, it's all taken care of. Don't worry about it. Just yeah. if anyone even asks you, it's like, just yeah. don't even worry about that. That's no big deal. We're, 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 oh, here having a good time. we're all good. Don't worry about it. Uh, yeah. One of the, you might, uh, some people might think I'm crazy to to say, and I, this is, this is um, something I've experienced being, having a peer, you know, that I looked up to uh, and also had a manager you know, sort of looked up to as well is to go is instead of to fly somewhere, drive. Yeah. Get in the car and drive somewhere with someone and you'll learn so much of <laughs> that person. And, and um, it's, it forces a discussion and you, and all of a sudden start, start talking. And I mean, some of the closest managers, oh, uh, you touch that stereo dial and peers. Yeah. You, you drive to New York city, you drive to Philadelphia you drive to New Jersey, and you're in yeah. the same car. Like it's unbelievable how quickly you, you bond with someone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I can think of uh, one person in particular who said, I never really knew you until we drove home from New Jersey that day when we missed our flight and we had to drive home, we got a rental car. And, um, I kind of always took that to, man, I, if I had the opportunity to drive and we, and we can to do the, do the day trip thing, it's, um, it's something weird about traveling, you know, well, together. It's, it's not like just traveling. Just relationships, moving. relationships built under a crisis or duress. So like, uh, you know, this, the data center goes down. Yeah. And it takes you, you know, all night to put it back together. You and one other person in that room fixing it. You know them now. You yep. come out of that a totally different relationship. Yeah. No matter how long you've known each other. Than the day you were when you went in there, right? That kind of thing. Um, so disaster one last question, recovery, right? Like that's another one, like big disaster recovery tests and stuff like that. Like, sure. you got an auditor in the room and you got to make sure you're going through everything. And then you go out to dinner afterwards and say, like, oh, God, I got through that. You know, you know what's Im it's important too is that in the beginning, it is you, only you and your partner. And this is sort of like my last question, basically. In the beginning, it is you and your partner, and you develop a bond because it can be a while. Yeah, that um, every other person that you hire will will know and feel like, wow, okay, Mike came in, then he hired Kate, and it was the two of them for five months, just getting all this shit done, like getting all the groundwork laid, everything like that. Then they brought in me. I'm an outsider. Like I have to get into the program. Yeah. So the chapter is written about your first person, but and we've already talked about the organization building in an earlier chapter, but there's also the element of bringing in the next person. Number three, yeah. number four, and number five and bringing them in. Right. This is where the, the front wheel, as I mentioned before, is so important with everyone you hire. Yeah. So, cause you're number one, number two, and then you're, uh, you're kind of, your number one will probably have a peer at some point yep. that's kind of the same level and the ability for that person to embrace and connect with someone new and bring them on board and make them feel included and welcome is, is, is a, is a quality of a, of a good leader or a, a good educator and trainer. Um, and I think that, is on you as a leader to make sure you're hiring people that can go on that journey with you to help that person come on board. So they don't feel like the outside They're Naturally they will at first, I get that. But for the more that it's not just the, the boss saying, you know, you're um, okay. Now you're in here to manage X, Y, Z and meet a over here. And we've been together for eight years or eight months. Um, yeah. There's some catching up. 
that needs to be done. But for that other person that's there to really be able to to outreach and make that person feel plugged in is important. And this happened to me, um, you know, at, at Carrick's, right? Was you, you may you may hire someone in who you've worked with for five or six years before, and you've brought that number one in, right, right away. And then your 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 number uh, two is coming in, who is at the same level as the number one, who you've never worked with before, yeah. right? And that number one that came in knew just how to bring that person on board and make them feel connected and help with roles and responsibilities and, and be a conduit uh, in some respects to the business. And to me, if there was uh, something right out of the gate that needed to be hashed out or there's some misunderstanding. And then it was on me to be very hyper-focused on that person, making sure they had everything they needed to, to get on board and understand the systems and their role and where they were going to fit into the organization and kind of helping them uh, o- overarchingly understand the roles of, of the number one versus the the new number one. Um, so that person being in, that's why another aspect of this, and we were talking about it a bit now, is number one that you bring in has to be able to work with new people who come in as peers and right. and help them feel connected and help them feel and it's it's on it cio as well to to foster that but it's just as important that that number one is uh sort of someone who wants to work with someone else as well and realizes that they're going to have one-on-ones with you too and it won't just be the two of you anymore um but a good manager and cio is gonna is gonna make sure that there's great committee-based meetings and cross-functional teams and that we're going to bars together and that we're traveling together and you know especially as the group stays small the get, group gets bigger and you've got seven or eight direct reports that's 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 more challenging right yeah and for sure this is when you spend you really do spend a lot of your time and as as and rightfully so as a cio building and managing and leading the team you're not you're, you're in the you're in the business strategy you're you're building the roadmap you're helping to approve get things done and make some key decisions when they need to come to you but a lot of the things that get done are going to be done by that core team you're building uh not by not as much by you you're you're going to be the person speaking to the the c levels and the and the and the executive team and and Nate said something earlier that's also important, uh, very important, is that when one of those eight people, you know, fall on hard times and things don't go as well, it's on you. If you're not, if you're not um, developing them, or even if they just don't, they they some, make a simple mistake. Like you need to k- take accountability for that as a leader um, to to your to your management team. Uh, that is one of again one of those points in this chapter that if I could put it on its own page. It's that no matter if any of your employees screw up ever, like anyone in IT, it's reflective of the CIO. Yep. And the CIO says, oh, no, no, I have, that person's four levels below me. I have no idea what they're doing. Then they are, you're, a, your team. You, you're, a, you're a terrible CIO. You, 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 yeah, exactly. You, you're, you, you're in the wrong role. You give them air cover, you protect them, you take accountability, Absolutely. and then you help them learn, right? Um, and you double down their learning. You you're like, okay, so awesome, you screwed up. Like, let's talk about what you learned and yeah. how. This is great. It's the best way to learn. Absolutely. That's like, that's, that's the it best. Killed way me when CIOs are like, no, 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 oh, it's all that person's fault. And I'm just, oh, are you kidding that, me? That in general, just bad management, right? I mean, that's oh, just terrible. a bad manager. I mean, across, any any not a, not even IT, just any industry, right? Any if you're industry. a manager of something and you blame a subordinate then you're just an, an ass hat um, <laughs> yeah that just that goes across the board yeah that's so all right well that was oh my god i've been going forever um i just had a whole other topic that came to came to my mind but i'm not going to bring it up now so i'm going to table it though I'll, I'll put it on a future future list um but uh so That was that was a great preamble. Well, actually, it was a great sequel 
to last week with EX yep. and a great prequel to next week, which is training education because we're still on the EX tip because your number one will have a huge impact on EX. Um, and I, I, just, <laughs> but I, not next week, sorry. Training education, whether next week or the week after, this is going to be a big chapter. So stay tuned. Um, in the moment, well, in a moment, we will continue on with our tech news and okay. get into the AI, AF stuff. But, um, Mike, and I want to thank you for listening to this episode. Thank you. Yes, definitely. It, please consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. We would give you a hundred stars for listening to our episode. So we hope that you would give us just five back or the maximum amount. Um, please buy our merchandise. We only get like a dollar or two, but every little bit helps. So we are tremendously in the hole on this podcast and we want to keep going and we're going to, but it would be um, nice for us not to have to go and explain to everybody else why we're throwing money at this uh, whole thing, even though we love to do it. And um, also don't be a dick um to anybody the world has plenty of dicks uh don't and especially don't be a dick to the hardworking it folks in your company um bark less wag more uh, and be cool yeah and it will get paid back in spades if you're just cool to the folks in your department watch what happens like if you're cool to them next time that your keyboard breaks it'll a new one will already be there <laughs> i mean literally like Hey, yeah. I see my keyboard is, and then all of a sudden there's a new one at your desk already. It's because you were cool. I don't like actually state that like I, 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 people have been extremely, um, most of the people that I've worked with have been extremely kind and understanding when, <laughs> when things don't go well. But I think there's also like, I try to keep in mind that some people just like, they are under so much pressure to get stuff done. So when those, People come out and they're they may be acting like dicks. It's like a okay, yeah, I can I can I can take that in. But yeah, we we appreciate when people are nice and it makes life easier. Um for well, everybody. And here I'm gonna disagree with you on this point. Is that even if you're having a terrible, terrible day. Yep. You have to remember why you're having a terrible day and that people in IT did not create <laughs> they, they, people in IT did not create your terrible day. That's correct. Yeah, I agree with they're, that. They're trying to fix one little tiny element of your terrible day. No. And um, unless you want to do like a heavy dose of amphetamines, which will fix your day, by just showing a little bit back to your IT person, they will return that back to you unless your IT person's a dick. In which case, well, I guess... <laughs> yeah, like, like let us know. We'll yeah. we'll we'll solve it for you. Like I'll solve your. I'll, yeah, yeah, send me an email. I'll solve your tech support. I'll fix your problem. Literally, I will come and fix your problem. Um, especially if you're on the West Coast. So, <laughs> all right. Well, that was awesome. Yeah. Now we get to talk about AI. Okay. Do you are you ready? Like. Let's go. I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So let me just make a note here. That was practically a record for us. Just under two hours. Perfect. But I tried to come up with a good batting order. So welcome to the AIAF side of the podcast. Yeah. It's AI as fuck. And there's a, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, I tried to make Mike put a batting order in place for this part of the news, but God, there's just so much. Um, so we can jump around every, every, every day, every day, every hour, every day. I am like, okay, I'll add these four new articles to, for research. And then I go down these rabbit holes because what? it's, when Maybe. someone writes an article, when someone writes an article, you know what the hardest part is? You have to you have to find out if it's true or not. True. And I can understand when when people are pissed off about the news, especially with um, some of these tech zines that 
have these writers that just write shit, but they they don't qualify it. Like they don't right. provide a source. They, There's no source material. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So well, what do you I think what we're saying right now, right? What we're talking about this very instant poses some some discussion, right? Is this stuff moves so fast that you can't keep up with even talking about it or researching it. So what does that say? Well, I mean, I mean it, it is so it is moving so fast and stuff's just being released and open sourced and yeah. like there's no way that humans can keep up with this. I'm, I, being, I'm being invited every day to join in this conference or this webinar about the frontier of AI and why CIOs should implement AI and why CIOs shouldn't implement AI and Gen AI is the future. Gen AI is the past. Like every day it's bullshit coming in. Right. So what I'm trying to do, and I've made this kind of like a side project of my life is to take it all in yeah, and put it into buckets of, okay, that's complete bullshit, FUD stuff. I'm not even going to deal with that stuff. That's plausible and stuff that's obviously realistic. And so the stuff that's plausible, I read it and I say, okay, like, please, please, please be a reference or links or things I can research or, or, or links to surveys. And so every now and then there's a link and I dive into it. I read the survey that was underneath it and the survey is wrong or they, they, they got their information incorrect. But I'd say maybe one out of five articles is trustworthy. But I would, what I would give like a trustworthy rating. Well, there's a lot of opinion too, right? I mean, a lot of, a lot of stuff. Opinion. Just people use the tool and they 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 think about where it's kind of like what we do sometimes. This is cool. Where is it going to go? What's getting? Let's let me write a story about that. Literally yeah. a story, like a potentially fictional story. Now and you know how I feel about fun to read, but you just you know how I feel about Gardner and Forrester and, and those companies. But I went I went back through some articles that I have from 2016 2017 symposium. And and I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it for for once in my life. Make a note. 8:57 p.m. Wednesday, March 13th. I'm gonna give it to Gartner because they called it. They gave a symposium in October 2016 on AI, and that chatbots would be so disruptive that nobody could talk about how chatbots were disruptive. It would be so disruptive that no one could quantify it. Yeah. Now, I I went back through all of my sort of PDFs from all those symposia, and I found this one PDF. I was reading this, and I'm like, is this a date, right? Like, is this, holy crap. Like, they nailed it because chatbots either fall into the, oh, my God, who gives a shit bucket? Yep. So you have a chatbot now. Great. Or in the... This is really transformative chatbot bucket. I'm glad yeah. you have it. Well, let, let me tell you this. It's interesting. Um, you know, we're implementing Slack right now, which is great. Um, but I got the question today. Slack bot thing's useless because the expectation now of a bot is that it's chat GPT. Yeah, yeah. So when you chat with something that's labeled bot, yeah. Now, now people expect it to talk back to you like a GPT. Right. And and when a product doesn't have that built in, it's like, well, why do we even have a bot? So it used to be chat bots are, oh, we can send commands to them or it'll give us the Wi-Fi password or it'll tell us when there's a notification from an application that's integrated. Now the expectation with anyone who's using a bot for the first time is like, this things need to be smart. And it's an yeah. automatic, automatic um, for people when they're using these chat bots. Like, why doesn't this thing know what I want? And I'm already experiencing it in Slack. So, and I know Slack's on the ball and they're doing AI and all this crap, right? I get it. But out of the box, people are like, this isn't that great. What's what's this bot? This bot doesn't do anything. So, so even the, the consumer mindset around bots is well. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you ask a bot now, a chat and watch out all these tech support sites that, that give you uh, still give you three answers when you write a chat in. Like, do you want to know more about the company or do you want to do a billing question? Like that's got to change tomorrow, yesterday, because people aren't going to use that crap anymore. So this so, it's become a consumer mindset. A bot is a smart bot, is an AI bot. And people have that expectation now 
when you put a system in that it's going to be able to do that, whether it works or not. It's just they expect an answer back, not not like a multiple choice question or nothing at all. So you have to, you have to understand though, but let's go back to like episode four. We started talking about this and how much mass media and the investment community is making the argument. We talked about this, Mike. Like the only reason AI exists is for revenue. There's no non-revenue purpose behind AI. So you have to accept that as A, uh, like a, a exhibit A. Ex AI only exists for revenue generating purposes today. So there was no, so Morgan Stanley yesterday listed high conviction stocks with US productivity opportunities thanks to artificial intelligence as companies have been focusing on efficiency gains. According to strategist Edward Stanley, the company's leadership at the Morgan Stanley's 2024 Technology, Media, and Telecom Conference stated that they were in the experimental phase of AI. But with the help of customer support gains and GitHub integrated into research and development processes, the margin expansion in these names should be meaningful in the second half of 24 into 25. Now, this Altman sorry, go ahead. Yep. said at the same conference that it will not be long before companies adopting AI start to outperform their peers, and it will not be easy to tell why from the outside. Now, that line, okay, Altman getting up in front of this giant Morgan Stanley investor conference and saying, yeah. it will not be long before companies adopting this technology start to outperform their peers. Well, based on what fucking evidence? That's insane uh, talk. Computers, innovation. No. Like, I mean, think, Nate, compared to the internet, like you don't think that pe the inter people not using the internet today because it wasn't a re it was a revenue generator would be, that, that it's, I mean, to me, it's just another wave of technology that's come along that people are going to have to use. And the internet is the same thing. Uh, if you didn't use the internet in the 90s or the, the early 2000s, you'd be out of business. So I think it's one of the, it's the same thing. It's not blockchain and it's not, and even you could argue the cloud is a, a, a subset, you know? Um, so so you know, things that you've got to adopt, I think to some extent over time, you just got to learn how to do it safely. And so uh, the point is that on this, so on the Seeking Alpha article, which is I was reading from, sure. you know, all, all, the, all these people comment on it. And one of them said, probably the most succinct way to sum this up. Yeah. Throw AI in front of anything or or use it in the same sentence as an attempt to justify the investment bank pump. Yeah. Everyone's getting desperate. And it he never has been more true than yep. perhaps in the last four weeks when everyone has had to declare that they have, they have AI in their product. Yeah. And I think it's uh, kind of like the e-business boom, right? It was kind of like uh, if you didn't have an e-business strategy in the late nineties, you were, you were, you didn't have a company like that wasn't. Yeah. But uh, like, there's a, there's a, there's gotta be an sec investigation or something along the lines. It's going to go after someone like an Altman saying, Hey, those that are using AI will have an advantage over their peers. There's nothing to substantiate that comment, but now yeah, what's it's everyone going to do. You said for revenue, but it's marketing just like any, anything else. Like there was, there are still people uh, saying that, if you're not on the cloud, you're, 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 uh, I mean, you could, you can point to evidence that the cloud helps, but you could point to plenty of evidence that there's security risks and that there's, you're, you're sinking money into the cloud when you don't know manage it. And then there's, there's two sides to every story. And I think Altman's just marketing his product. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent defending everything he says, but I think it is for revenue. And if you're for revenue, then you're going to oh, try and sell your product. I'm not and defending not, all the either. The SEC but... should investigate him because he's selling uh, open AI. I think the biggest issue that open AI has is that it's not open and that it's 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 closed and no one can inspect it. And it's going to be, and while, while others are opening, they're closing more and more. And they're right now, they're still the best. Debatably. No, 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 no. Let me, I have some data for you that might change your mind on that. I've seen, yeah. uh, I've seen the data too. The most I, common, maybe not the best. Well, there, there's, there's ten new ones every day, so I think there is a best one that's better. Um, so, yeah, I, 
the, I was going to talk about Mistral tonight. Mistral, but well, I'm going to save them for next week or the week after. Mistral is fantastic. Yeah, Mistral also. But hey, it's going to keep going like this, like this, like that. Every day it's going to change. So, I like, know, but Mistral one, also uh, is has no problem with, um, and we talked about this in a former episode. Yeah, uh, they, being being aligned with deep fakes, um, creating massive. Um, well, I won't get into it, but. Oh no no no! Absolutely, um, it's open source though, and that's the risk. I mean, yeah. and then the, the, and that's going to be true of all the other stuff too. So it's going to be up to whoever, like uh, IBM, is using Mistral, right? So it's yes. up to them to leverage that language model and put the barriers around it. It's yes. not going to be Mistral who's going to do it. They're just going to put the code out and continue to enhance it, um, and they can be criticized for that. Absolutely. But I, I think there's going to be a lot of open source. Uh, uh, Grok is going to be open source now. Um, yes. And take take and that's what I mean. Like this stuff is moving so fast that it's going to be up to new businesses to control it. Not or the not just the government, but new business models. Just like we have governance for GXP and for SOX and all these other things, there'll be a whole new industry to regulate AI that's going to emerge. And it's mm. for revenue. They're going to be commercial businesses that are going to come in and they are going to figure out a good revenue stream to make money, uh, whether it is for the betterment of people and they can make a good dollar amount off of that. They can build the analytics models that you've discussed in the past, Nate, about kind of right now they're, very, they're only to the certain section of people who can afford to access them or know how to. That can help liberate that data, but also make pennies on the dollar and and give it to millions and make millions and billions of dollars. So I think there's a whole new, what will emerge is not, there'll be legislation and stuff, but I think there will be a private enterprise that's going to try and regulate AI for the betterment of business, the use cases, business. Um, it could be overall just uh, equity and opportunity. For, for people overall, uh, social social issues, uh, it could be education, and all of these companies are going to build a whole new layer, I think, to help regulate. Well, well, the Mistrals and the um, Metas, Meta will probably try and do it all. Um, they, they're going to end up being sort of the Linux of the cloud, is that they... There's, there's tons of companies that have been in the 90s and early 2000s that built their business around open source and around Linux. Um, it wasn't the, the community of Linux who built that was forced to regulate it. It was the Red Hats and others. And similarly with the cloud and AWS and Amazon um, and Google, like there's layers and layers and layers of governance and um, support apparatus on top of those things. So I think the same thing will happen with AI. Right now, just the, the core players are like OpenAI, Meta, and Microsoft, and Google, and Apple are so rich that they're going to try and do it themselves. And I think that's where the, the 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 problem is: is they're trying to do too much. Like if Mistral tries to put all these barriers in, I, I just don't think it will work. There needs to be some independent company that's going to try and capitalize on that uh, over time. Oh, we still so... get that could happen in a month. Who knows? Could happen. So there, there's a there's a um, uh, I'm trying to think of the mathematical term, but there's a there's a there's a point that we're reaching, where uh, what's it called? It's called uh, data gravity. Data gravity is the term, and it came out back in like 2008 or 2008 2009. Um, I have to look, let me look at data data gravity. One second. I'm taking a look. Gravity. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, two thousand. Oh, hold on. That's uh. Two thousand ten. So that that the uh, the idea is that data or activity that's around data attracts and creates more data. Okay, that's a data gravity. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um. But what's happening is that so so Claude three or the Claude three family just just got announced, and we'll talk about that in a second. It's but, freaking amazing, by the way. That's, I know 
And we'll go, we'll go, I'll go over the stats in just a minute, but, yeah. but essentially this, uh, this theory is that if you're, it costs money to transmit data. So if you're transmitting a gig of data, it's about 10, 10 cents on the dollar. Yeah. Okay. And, and one gig of data might be like 250 million input tokens uh, or so, so, so on and so forth. Yeah. So the cost of processing data is higher than the cost of transmission. Okay, so you have cost of data, cost of transmission. They're not necessarily parallel yet. And given the computational intensive part of LLM, the latency is high enough that sending your image doesn't actually add that much latency. Okay, so if you're building like uh, your LLM on um, OpenAI or Anthropic or AWS or Google Cloud, yeah. um, no problem. But it has implications, right? Because eventually, you're going to want to send smaller amounts of data. Like you won't want to send big amounts of data because it will actually be more cost efficient for you to send less amounts of data. Yeah. And we talked about the Ray Wang uh, industry 5.0 thing back in like episode nine, which we'll come to in a back, back to in a minute, but this idea of companies controlling data, mm -hmm. how much data you get. So think about this now, right? It's a very, very oblique concept, but you Google uh, an idea, like a thought, right? You get all everything Google has, they just give it to you. Mm -hmm. Now you may have to scroll down to the bottom or go two or three pages in, but think you're going to get everything that exists out there. Yeah. Imagine if that was throttled because it was more cost efficient to throttle what you got. If, if, L, if using LM was your choice source, yeah. It was more efficient for the person who's giving that to you to throttle the amount of information you got. Then, of course, your your information would be curated because it was more cost efficient that way. Yeah, uh, that's the example of data gravity, and it's becoming a consideration. So, yeah, with, of IP and copyright and everything else, absolutely. Exactly. And so, with yeah. Claude, or as you call it, Cloud, people, it's called Cloud, but I say Claude. Claude has just released. Three, they call it the Claude Three family. Yeah. So Opus, which is the largest, and the one I've been using like the last week, and most capable, uh, Sonnet, which is the most cost effective. That's the one that throttles. Okay, so so Sonnet throttles output. If you ask Opus and Sonnet the same question, Opus will give you like this whole giant thing. Sonnet's going to give you a more half baked answer. In Haiku which is the smallest, fastest, and least expensive. Mm -hmm. So when companies decide to deploy something using Anthropics Engine, um, you're, as the consumer, uh, going to be the recipient of either the full answer, a truncated answer, or a very abbreviated answer. Now, that's a yeah. family of three. What that's if... That's what the vendor chooses to to use right to exactly. to give to you right so the third party vendor who's using the engine do you see where the, you see where this is going mike where where's where's the war going to be fought will it be oh well my solution doesn't throttle but it costs x mm -hmm. versus the competitor who throttles who costs y and so yeah. you're now as a consumer saying well do i want to use chrome or do i want to use edge do I want to use X or do I want to use Y? Like, what's going to be my solution? And ultimately, people will start picking camps. People will start picking solutions. Like, why well, only use X? Yeah, I, yeah. I pay this much money to get this much information back or to have this much of a, of a fabric, right? Right. And that's why it's so important that, you know, there's as much, you know, openness to it and, it, you know, all the biases and other things that AI can can have built into it are, are worked out. That's much easier said than done. But I think um, one area where it could change things is, is the on-device AI, I think is going to get way more uh, popular as time goes on. I am really, really interested to see what happens at WWDC for Apple this year. I think they're going to be one of the companies that starts to turn the rudder back onto the device. So in terms of people's accessibility, yeah, you have to buy an iPhone, of course, right? 
but um, the whole idea of getting more stuff on device for AI and getting um, the ability to ask questions and getting a certain set where the compute is happening on device. And yeah. if I think about shared resources in the future, it's really, po we talked about SETI at home a few weeks ago. I think it's really possible that on device computing is what liberates some of this stuff because right now, you, I think right now we're thinking about chatbots and we're you know, thinking about an application that pulls that data Keep through. Talking. I have to fix the light over there. Sure. Um, that, that pulls data through uh, into a, a chat-like mechanism. I think this stuff is built more directly into the apps to get small tasks done, like the small, um, small language model um, sort of use cases. But this is just like consuming the cloud. And there'll be certain, and not some information piece, but from a cost perspective, it'll the costs will go down over time. And the compute, the question is, we have enough compute and energy to do, <laughs> to do all this, but is, I think the costs of these AI transactions are gonna go down significantly over time. What I'm most concerned about is that the big, you know, three or four or five, Provide all the services because they're able to produce it for the least amount of money. So Microsoft is the one that scares me the most because but, okay, they all... Can I pause you real sec? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But they'll reach a floor of cost before they start coming back up again. Like, I don't think that they'll keep to de keep decreasing. Oh yeah. It, it's, I it'll, be a, it'll be a buyer. It'll be, it'll be a, a buyer's oh, market. Like you'll, you'll pick. Yep. And that, that's where I, I think to, to, to your point, you don't really know where your information's coming from. Right. You're never, you're not going to know if you're talking to cloud or to open AI or to Bing or whatever. I mean, you, as a, as a consumer, you're going to have no idea. Like if you use notion right now, which AI engine are you using? You, right. you have to go look for it. You have to go figure it out. It's a great, using it's a great point. AI. What are you using? Nobody cares or knows that is just using it. In the, like we care. But a lot of people just they're just like, oh, that gave me an answer. Great. And that's to your point of who has access to what data is that, you know, the these these owners of the AI underneath, they can decide. And that's that's a little bit scary. Um yeah. I mean, but, ultimately, ultimately what we're seeing with cloud 3.0 and their family that's being released between Opus, um, Sonnet, and um, Haiku is that this optionality is coming out. So OpenAI had OpenAI. They had GPT-3.5 and then GPT-4. GPT GPT Great. Yep. Then Dolly was a separate product. Then Dolly became part of GPT-4 Plus or Pro um, or Turbo. And then Gemini 1.0 came out. Then Gemini 1.5 came out. So you're starting to see optionality, to your point, people are accessing it via the web or via a direct uh, fat client. But what's going to happen is those will go away. Or maybe not. Maybe you'll still be able to access cloud from cloud.ai and ask a question. But more often than not, it's going to be integrated into the thing that you're using already. And you just won't know it. That's right. Completely agree. And so when they were talking about costs, they were saying that Opus, which is the biggest of the three, costs about $15 per 1 million tokens of input and $75 for, per 1 million, dollars of, 1 million tokens of output. Sonic costs 3 and 15 and then Haiku is 25 cents and 125 in the same ratios. And that Opus kicked the crap out of GPT-4 and Gemini 1.0 Ultra on all these different benchmarks. Um, now, the other part too is that where Opus is gaining its its fame is that it um, it aced all the needle and haystack tests. So, and for instance, in one test, they took um, all these different articles around startup behavior, work culture, engineers, all these things about startups. They inserted a random sentence about pizza toppings. Not only did the model answer all the questions correctly, it also said to them, um, I suspect the pizza topping may be inserted as a joke. 
So it detected that, Un right? It's unbelievable. And uh, and so, well, I mean, what it matters is like of all of them, cloud is the one that has the sort of strongest constitution. They have the Triple H philosophy, yeah. and so on and so forth. But to your point, they will be the back end to something else. Yeah. Um, and in their own po in their own uh their own press release they put cloud open three opus cloud open three opus cloud three sonic cloud three haiku against gpt4 gemini 10 ultra gemini 10 pro and across the board opus beat everybody from yep. undergraduate level knowledge to graduate level reasoning to grade school math to multilingual math, reasoning over text, knowledge Q and A, and common knowledge. Okay, um, and of course, if you used it, you know. Now, in terms of strong vision, so Cloud Three also allows now finally the uploading of photos, charts, graphs, technical diagrams. So for math and reasoning, Cloud and Gemini Ultra tied. Gemini Ultra kicked the crap out of Cloud on document visual Q and A. Gemini 1.0 Ultra kicked the crap out of everybody in terms of math. Uh, Cloud 3 Sonnet beat everybody on science diagrams. And Cloud 3 Haiku beat everyone on chart Q&A. Um, but here's the real the real stat right here. Um, in terms of cost, uh, Opus, as I said before, is $15. There'll be 1 million tokens input and $75 for every 1 million output with a context window of 200,000 tokens. So in terms of cheapness, we've reached a new bottom. Yep. Someone's going to go below that. Someone will then go below that. But I say all this because these dollar amounts yep. equal what we will be talking about five years from now when we decide how much money we want to invest annually on data that we want to purchase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you go into your IT budget or you go into your family's budget and you say, okay, this year we're going to put aside $10,000 to buy data to allow people in my department to search on things. I'm going to set aside $10,000. Then the next year, $100,000. That will be how much you have to pay to purchase data. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I'm not sure I, that would ever sell. I think that you're paying $9 per month for the service of your choice. Maybe you're paying it, you're paying it five times for five different subject areas, but I think all of that is obfuscated for you as a consumer. You're not even going to you may put, yeah, you may put a budget aside, I guess, to buy services for, for AI data, for data, but I think it's all going to be shrink wrapped in some service that you're going to consume like TV. You know, I think it's, um, you, you, you're not even going to realize you're talking to AI or that you're using AI. It's just. Well, I'm not talking about that. I mean, that will be built into your Samsung TV or you know, your iPhone 17, like yeah, probably, as a consumer. Yeah. Not as a business, but talking a about business. like when you go to Google something, or when you want to, when you want to learn something new, like how will you do that? Well, it'll be part of a plan. I mean, mm. you won't, you won't get to know something without having paid for that, whether it's through owning a phone on a plan or paying for a service on your TV, you'll have to pay to know something. How do we deal with that today? How do businesses do the rhetorical question a bit, but what, how, how does that get handled today with ads, oh. right? Uh, and I think there's a lot of very, very clever ways when I ask a question in any of these services that they could, I'm sure they're working on right now, that the answer tries to get you to think about what you might need to buy. And you'll have that engine, you'll get access to all the data, but right. you'll get you'll get that engine and yeah, the data is mixed. You know, you're going to get these kind of hints and ads mixed in, but you, you will get access to the data because I think there's still more advertising revenue. We're talking about revenue, right? 
yeah. for, to be made up to maybe even more so than anything else to be made off of AI because there's more clever ways to access people, yeah. their eyeballs, their ears, their minds to think they're talking to a human or talking to another person or they're talking something so friendly to them that they begin to trust it. And when that person says, you know what, you'd look great in that sweatshirt or you really should, uh, based on all these questions you've asked, you know, you might be really interested in looking at buying a house in this area because you've asked all these questions and I can connect you um, and I can talk to you about it with the human voice. And I, I think there's a lot of ways that more money will be made off of these products through advertising that doesn't look like the ads of today um, that that will that will come to be as opposed to us paying for the data now to pay to play paywalls you know as we deal with new york times and other stuff absolutely agree there'll be the premium services that people can can pay for and that's that's getting more popular as as but, prices go up but i think that the average i think there's gonna be a balance and there'll be a big debate over whether or not it's fair that these things are just as influential as people and that they're selling you things. They're not giving you the answers to your questions. They're, they're giving you the answers to the question kind of along with some other ancillary thing to get you to, and use your data, use your data that you've asked. Well, let, 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 me, let, me, let me pause you for one second. Sure. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, I'm um, going rabbit hole here. The cloud three family is updated as of August 23. Yep. And August 23, and you can disagree, oh. August 23 is about the time that the bullshit snowball began for AI. Like about the time that the, the insanity started in rapid succession. Mm -hmm. So most of the news that's been generated since August of 23 is relatively topically centered around say five or six things we have a we have a terrible war going on in the siberian region we have a political election that's going on that's a, a farcical at best and we have ai like we have we have so few sort of global news stories at that level but we have a couple and uh so so cloud for whatever reason stopped at august 23 but that's what cloud three is up to now if you want to find information out about new york times uh, do you need today's article or would you be okay with say finding an article from a year ago? And I, and I ask you this because the discussion about New York times has already been brought up in a major lawsuit. Yes. Yep. And how long until the New York times just realizes that it's actually better to monetize their data by selling it to AI to be redistributed. Exactly. Or build with some sort of time delay perhaps, or a paywall to the AI service, then it becomes available, which brings us right back to the beginning of the search engine model. And I mean, frankly, 1993, um, when people had to sort of like figure out how to get their news, Yeah, you know, the AP uh, did, had to deal with this in UPN and the uh, Reuters and they had to figure out how to sort of get our news out there without giving all the news away. Like get the news out, but not all the news. Make them pay for the rest of the news. Yeah. So we're not we're not too far away from getting to a point in time where New York Times and Washington Post and Chicago Tribune are saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, have it all, but it's on a delay. Or they got to pay for it. Yeah. And this will be our new medium of distribution. And if you can't pay for it, you can't have it. Mm -hmm. And so right now you can still buy a, a Sunday New York Times, right? Yeah. But for how much longer? And I, again, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist. No, I, I agree. Go ahead. But, but this is this was Ray Wang's point. Like we talked about this in episode nine. His point was that this this industry 5.0, yeah. which is like the, this whole fourth industrial fourth revolution never happened it was all a farce but industry 5.0 was data yeah companies, companies will be built they're being built as we speak to control data and who gets it yeah by virtue of putting it behind an ai distribution mechanism mm -hmm. which we're seeing manifest in terms of the small one the medium one and the big one 
and of course gemini pro gemini ultra gpt4 turbo and gpt5 which is coming that striation yeah but all I, the others that are coming by grok at all and i'll put my conspiracy hat on too um on, on this one new york times isn't going to be the news 10 years from now these 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 media and journalism companies they're they're everyone is jumping ship and building their own because they'll be able to so the question will be whether or not independent journalists and in the people who and owners of big companies break it up and splinter it up and build gpts or whatever we're going to call them um to to get their story out to get their reporting out and the question will then be you know are they going to attempt to monetize these things or are they going to use a platform to get the residual back and i think that we're already seeing this happen in some of the social media places where people are breaking away and podcasts i mean Podcasts are where a lot of people get their news now. They don't go to New York Times. And that's why the New York Times and these, they have to put a paywall up because the advertising isn't going to get them the amount of money that they are expecting to make because people aren't reading it as much, I don't think. So I, I think there's sort of this balance of where the rest of the information industry goes. And someone's going to figure out a way to make, you talked about revenue before, someone's going to figure out make a lot of money off this but the more people who have access to it and can generate, whether it's data or revenue, are going to put it out there. And it's and then the engines on the back end are just going to be the machines, the gears that are working. And someone also puts something in front of it. That And to the point of the data, the, the, the New York Times piece is that New York Times may very well build a, a GPT on the GPT app store, you know, type thing. But I think before then they're going to license their data or attempt to license their data to AIs, like you said. And I don't know how lucrative that's going to be for them either. So unless they really build their own and they can control all the revenue, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how they'll do it and compete with uh, very new uh, news organizations oh. that are emerging from every corner of the earth right now such a nasty topic because you're talking about look what happened with um bitcoin mining right bitcoin <laughs> mining when it first started um i could use my laptop here to mine bitcoin all day my little laptop no problem and then my laptop wasn't enough i needed something with a additional gpu yeah i needed a desktop with four gpus then needed then i need eight servers in a rack with 16 gpus each now people are building GPU farms in the size of mountains. Yes. Just to mine a single Bitcoin. You're talking about two things that are, that are seemingly inevitable to me. One is that we can only create news as fast as it, as it emerges. Mm -hmm. and so you can create as many alternate stories to the truth as you want, but the truth is the truth. There's like a central point, and then there's all the bullshit that comes around it, right? Yeah. So let's say that for every truth, there's a hundred stories, maybe. Now you got to sell those. You got to, you got to figure out a way to monetize your perspective on the truth to your audience. Yep. It's going to be all opinion micro sense. You will make like sense, like percentages of percentages of sense you will make on a story that you create, which means that you'll either have to mass generate stories or the people that are able to create the truth of stories, the perceived truth are the ones at the top of that pile that make the most money. And to use the same Bitcoin metaphor, everyone at the bottom is mining to get the truth to the top, to be that story that's picked, that's distributed back out for, for revenue sharing. And the AI engines ultimately decide which truth that they're going to subscribe to. Yep. So listen to, so when Google partnered with Reddit, yep. Google put a press release out on February 22nd. So uh, 21 days ago. Uh, yeah. Google said, we've had a long standing relationship with Reddit for many years. And I don't know what that means, but yeah, sensibly it means that they've been best best friends. 
Today, we're sharing a number of ways we're deepening our partnership with across the company, so on and so forth. First, we're pleased to announce a new cloud partnership that enables Reddit to integrate new AI power capabilities into using Vertex AI. Mm -hmm. So there's your first alarm bell. Yep. Reddit intends to use Vertex AI to enhance search other capabilities in the Reddit platform. Okay. Then a whole bunch of other text. <laughs> to enable these and other experiences, Google now has access to Reddit's data API. Yep. Which delivers real-time structured, unique content from their large and dynamic platform. So forget the rest of this article. Google bought in to Reddit's data. The same way they bought into use that data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now it's, okay. So Google bought Reddit. Reddit's got, I don't know, 1% of their data is worthwhile. The rest is trolls. Okay. So let's forget that one for a second. Yeah. What about the next one then? So then Tumblr <laughs> and, WordPress, and WordPress sell, sold their data to mid journey and open AI. Yep. In a response. Uh, the exact types of data from each platform going to each company are not spelled out in documentation, but internal communications reviewed by 404 media make clear that deals between automatic, the platform's parent company are imminent. So can I, can I talk about a little tangent here? Real Can quick. I just finish? I, well, hold on, let me finish one more thing. Finish that, yeah. I have the trifecta of doom. So, <laughs> in September 23, WordPress changed the language of their developer page, explaining how to access a fire hose of a million daily WordPress posts to add feeds are intended for partners like search engines, AI products, and market intelligence providers. Okay, before then, the page did not make the, the AI use case in a statement. However, it's now become clear that this WordPress fire hose allows AI companies like AI, OpenAI and Cloud to buy access to a million posts a day. Yep. So in the span of two weeks, we have three critical announcements of three major data firms mm -hmm. opening the kimono to the AI companies. Go ahead. So this this emerges a new business model, I think, that is going to grow. And there's already a couple, a couple companies, I think, that are on the road there. And that's 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 private data. So I think, you know, there's there's the more that people catch on that this is happening, right? And if they care, a lot of people probably don't care at all. But because we care. we post stuff on Facebook and we do all this their new car, right? So I do think though, when it comes to email, when it comes to instant messaging, when it comes to some even some searching, you know, something you're searching about a medical condition or mental health or something that people want privacy. They don't know they don't have it right now, but right. By this data getting sold, there's, there's a real ability for Apple and others who are not, who are, who sell themselves as privacy organizations to start to talk about encrypted at rest, um, data, data or data farms, data search engines, email services, messaging services, all of those things that are that are really important to people that are untouched by AI. And I think that there are businesses that might get a little scared knowing that their data lives with Microsoft or their data lives with Google or their data lives with any company, whether they're a data company or not, is is openly accessible and buried somewhere in the in the, the the service agreement is that they can use their data to make their services better. And that can mean so many different things, right? And you can you can we can we can translate it however we want from a legal perspective and from an IT perspective. But 
I think there's going to be emergence of services that are very much focused on having zero trust, zero knowledge of the data that's being stored. And there might be social media that emerges as well in this space that creates a real firewall for AI. And it depends on where the culture of the, the country and the planet goes. Is that is it? Is it time to lock down our data sets to protect our revenue streams and make it so that they cannot be searched for, which makes them less accessible to everyone, right? Or is it time to have sort of an alternative service that's going to protect certain data sets um, that are that's still public information um, that protects certain data sets? So I think it's going to be that there will be a few companies that really try and sell that to sell their products um, over the course of the next year or two. Who, Mike? To who? To, well, I think to, to people. They're going to make people realize by marketing that their data is being sold like to AI. I'm not going to pick on your parents or my parents, but do our parents care? No, no, they don't. But okay. I, think, I do think some of the younger generation will care and, and does care. Okay. Uh, I think that it's more like, let's take a Apple's the one that keeps coming to mind because what they've always sold is, you know, if you have this device, which they, they have their privacy issues too, but that you buy this device, your stuff is safe. And they use every single string to pull to get you to think about, well, you, did you know that all your medical information on Android can just be saved to Google Fit and they, they have access to everything? Did you even think about that? Because on Apple Health, that's all on your device. And they did an ad about that, right? It was someone, you're typing something in and everyone around yeah. them. Okay. It. So AI can do that right now with any of these services. Um, if, if the owner of the data, which is not you or me, is Facebook or Twitter or Reddit, can just sell the data publicly in front of everyone uh, to be consumed by AI engines and I, not a lot of people know what you and I are talking about right now is happening. It's not headline news. It's not scaring everyone. Um, it's, you know, we're focused on TikTok right now. Um, so, I mean, that, there's there's a lot of things that are happening under the radar. TikTok, the, uh, the, the, the world's biggest fear at the moment. I, I baffles me, but okay. So... And it's people don't care. They give. They don't just put everything up there. We don't care if people see it. I think the the government's afraid of influence, and it's all just an algorithm. And it's all our own stuff. There's no one from these other countries posting stuff. It's just how it's being organized and fed to us from our own people, right? It's scary. I'm gonna tell you this little it's a little story. Um, we're getting uh, cable uh, internet set up at our new house. Sure. And I called the uh, local company and I said, you know, I just want your best, like whatever your best plan. It was like $86 a month for one gig internet or whatever it was. Yeah. And the woman says to me, well, we have, we can include for $8 a month, the round the clock IT service and support and security thing on top of it with data protection and blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, how do you do that? She said, well, it's proprietary, you know, we installed some software, <laughs> but here's, and I was like, no, thanks, you know, whatever. But here's the thing that kills me is that I'm probably the minority. Yeah. in saying no. It's only $8 a month and I'll be safe. Assumed security. And so when my parents go and they're like $8, oh, we can afford that on our retirement savings. They don't realize that they're basically putting an agent on their computers which is like literally siphoning every bit of data that they're doing back to a farm. So with that in mind, I don't know. I'm, I'm dubious. I, I'm actually, I think, I think my kids will, um, and, and your son will have a field day with this, but my kids will be savvy enough to say absolutely effing no, no way. But there's still 25, 30 more years left of Gen X to to profit off of their ignorance on this topic. And we, there's only not even more talking about this because this yeah. isn't the news part. The news part is, hey, Claude, 
3.0 is out. It's faster. Yeah. Shoes isn't, oh, by the way, it's all part of it. I really want to see what happens in, uh, in June because and I, I think it's one of the biggest AI events for and against that we'll see. I And I might be completely wrong, but I think there's this is an Apple's best interest as as a not a data company, it, or they are, but they they don't sell themselves as one, is to really try and open people's eyes to some of this stuff, and that they're going to do their own, but they're going to do it on device, and they yeah. has its own security risks, but the, I wouldn't be surprised if they try and place a little bit of fear, rightfully so, place a little bit of fear in people. Who right now only have OpenAI, Meta, and and Google, and all of these companies that are service based companies, to get the information, like to, to hear the news about, and they've kept quiet for a long time, and I I would have a hard time believing they're going to do it just like everyone else. So, I I think they're one company that their announcement will be or announcements will be telling to see. A, how they're received, but also will they mold some of the changes that need to happen with some of the concerns we certainly have around AI. And then the emergence of, of encrypted at race data for consumers. Right now, it's a business thing. Yeah. We, we, we care about it in IT. We care about it in cybersecurity. Will there be more consumer-driven products, even social networks, that do a zero-knowledge model and start to say you're protected from AI, and and as much as right now nobody thinks that way, but down the line, you know, do do you want all your posts to end up in a in a learning engine uh, when people start to learn what that is and what it means? That well, someone doesn't build a product around that and around people's fear. This is why. Well, what you're talking about is why um, in the last, I have to go back and look, but the last I would say two weeks, maybe three weeks. I'm getting hit by announcements about all these new RAG classes, mm -hmm. retrieval augmented generation classes that are now popping up on Coursera and Udemy and these other, other places where RAG is now the new skill. Like um, it used to be process engineering and um, like query development, but now RAG is the new for the, for March the new skill to have. Like if yep. you can figure out a, a way to sift through the garbage better than everybody else, essentially the rag aspect, you're going to sort of win. There's a article in computer world and I generally, I, I generally run into problems when I'm trying to source um, data on computer world articles. But this one actually, I found a few, I was able to sort of trace these things back uh, the article is called The ROI in AI yeah. and How to Find It by Lucas Miriam. This is from February 29th. I'm going to have to hit the uh, restroom real quick. <laughs> okay, I'll just keep going. I'll keep going. I'll be right back. Actually, you know what? While you're going, I'm going to grab a beer. Okay, sounds good. I will be right back. Sir, it's... I'll be right back, everybody, too. I'm going to go right over here and grab a beer from the old beer fridgey. Let's see. Oh, oh, torpedo. Torpedo's good. These guys. Ah. Torpedo is not for the faint of heart. But we're going to have a go at it. Do our best to make this torpedo work. While Mike is gone, I will plug the launch of the Luminaries Forge, the newest IT leadership development uh, program today. Beats the crap out of those uh, leadership classes at Harvard and MIT. No, you don't get a fancy certificate, unfortunately, but you will actually get learning. Um, deep, immersive leadership learning which you can use in your actual career as opposed to a bullshit certificate that costs you 30 grand. So uh, luminariesforge.com, check it out. Um, I'm the primary teacher. 
I have six amazing experts teaching alongside me. And it's a nine month immersive course. You'll come out ready to kick ass on the IT leadership front. Um, how I recommend it. It's luminariesforge.com. There yeah. he is. He's back. All right. So anyway, this article from Computer World by Lucas Mirian, February 29th. There's a bunch of uh, Gartner quotes in here. I'm not going to read them all because uh, you never know. It's hard to prove Gartner quotes and where they get their information from. But ultimately, the question was, uh, how do you set a value on intangibles? Well, um, and this goes back to our point of diminishing returns and lowest denominator. Uh, this is a quote from um, Rita Salem, a distinguished vice president analyst at Gartner. Salem says, ultimately, you may be able to use less skilled developers, so costs may go down and you can handle more work with the same number of developers, which is um, obvious math. She goes on to say, I think it's a she. Uh, they go on to say, these benefits could ultimately lead to earlier revenue generation and possibly less customer and developer attrition and higher customer spend. Now that last one, customer spend, what the fuck does that mean? Okay, but we'll come back to that. Uh, according to McKinsey, last year was seen, last year being 23, as the year of enterprise AI adoption. So they're giving it a name. That's McKinsey, with 55% of organizations experimenting with Gen AI and workflows. I have no idea what their N is. I couldn't find their survey data. Their N is probably somewhere between 10 and 1,000. So whatever. 55% of that N uh, is experimenting with Gen AI. Mm -hmm. AI for them. Uh, from the same data set, however, fewer than a third of enterprises surveyed said they were using AI for more than one function. Suggesting that AI use remains limited in scope. Uh, okay, so then Gardner has some quotes about the end of the world, so on and so forth. But here's where it gets interesting. Um, Brett Greenstein, who's the data and AI leader at professional services firm PricewaterhouseCoopers. So now we have our third analyst firm within two pages of this review. Goes on to say, once you get Gen AI to consistently achieve this new level of performance, you deploy it in production with the proper governance and operational processes and track its usage, Greenstein said. Greenstein said, when you have a use case that saves two hours and a six hour process and track its usage, you can then aggregate the savings. Now, they did not read what Mike and I have already read, which is that in fact, uh, the money used to make an AI work is fixed. So rather than, um, no matter how good you are on Gen AI, you can have the best developers in the world. You still operate at a fixed cost. So where do you save money? By using less AI, not by using more AI. It's not even about using better AI. It's about using less AI. Now, that could be the same as using better AI, but when you talk about aggregating savings, and again, I don't know what these numbers mean. When you have a use case that saves two hours in a six-hour process, uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, something that takes six hours, now it's two, and so you've saved four. Great, but did you just get less stuff? That's not clear in this article, but let's just go with this because well, hold on, it gets a little bit better. So this is, uh, again, this is a PWC. This one actually refers to a survey, the 2023 Emerging Technology Survey, which I looked at, um, the N varied. Uh, I don't know what the N was for this question, but Here's the statement. There's a little, little debate about Gen AI's impact on productivity. As it could add the annual equivalent of $2.6 trillion 
up to $4.4 trillion globally, according to McKinsey. Mm -hmm. Now, this is from a PwC survey, but they're quoting McKinsey. So the editor of the article screwed up or PwC cited McKinsey. And about 75% of the value falls into four areas. Customer operations equals revenue. Marketing and sales, revenue. Software engineering, revenue. R&D, revenue. And I will finish my soliloquy by simply stating that... Um, hold on. There was one more piece of this article which I found interesting. Uh... <laughs> Actually, there were two. One said, there's two. Same article. And I'm sorry. I'm just, I have to read this. According <laughs> to Gartner, calculating the value of new investments in Gen AI requires an organization to first build a business case, which is Gartner speak, by simulating potential costs and value across a range of activities. This means aiming for a mix of quick wins differentiating use cases and transformational initiatives, which is a three bullet phrase that Gartner has been saying since 2005. Gen AI quick wins focus on potential productivity improvements, which today typically come from assistance such as Microsoft 365 Copilot and Google Workspace, which is not a fucking assistant. <laughs> Those kinds of activities are easy to get started, try out and buy, but they are task specific. The mm -hmm. time to recognize value is less than a year. Okay, so I had to read that one. But hold on. Hold on, hold on. I'm almost done. Now, now, where's that quote? Here it is, right here. Sorry. According to PwC, and I don't know what this, this didn't come from any survey I could find. The best AI projects tend to fall into two categories. Simple use cases that require little effort to create and are used broadly and high volume efforts that can be costly but scale up. Okay. Yes. I don't know what the fuck that means. But I want to read it because in, in the truth of obviousness, however you want to scale it, uh, between cloud having three different versions, Gemini having 1.0, 1.5, uh, Grok coming out with its new open source platform. Um, and of course, I've been, I got to tell you, Mike, I've been killing myself over um, Llama 2, 270B um, from, from Grok. It's so freaking fast. Yeah. Doesn't matter what you use. Nope. It doesn't matter how many developers you have, how good they are, how fast they write. Ultimately, however much money you save will be determined by how much information you give out. Am I wrong? Tell me if I'm wrong. How much information you give out as an organization? How much information you give out per query? How much information oh. you distribute every time that someone uses your Gen AI product? Is the cost savings from Gen AI determined by the people who develop it or how much information is squeezed out of it? Where's the, let me, let me rephrase the question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and propose to my CEO that we move forward with Gen AI. And I want to say that it's going to save us this much. It's going to save us X by doing this, right? And I can say it's going to save us X because it's going to reduce these four employees. I don't need them anymore. On the other hand, it's going to cost us Y to go ahead and do this. Yep. How do I come up with the X and the Y numbers? It's a great question. Yeah, it's difficult because of the soft cost and that you could... You got to, I think finding the why is the hard one right now because it's pretty unpredictable on the on the AI side as to what it's really going to cost you to to build it. Um, but I also think we talked about verification of data and that's probably not 100% there yet either. So it's a break even probably, and maybe even a loss um, to some extent in the in the current in the current situation. And there's also probably not the talent. 
in terms of the people who know how to develop those things that you'll be able to acquire to do them that won't be cost prohibitive, at least at this point. Um, but for smaller wins, smaller gains, you know, similar to what Gartner was saying around the collaborative tools, there's probably little quick wins here and there that can make uh, short and little basic tasks. But uh, if you're going to do a big project with AI, I think you got to be prepared to not only spend a little bit more, but also be prepared to fail a few times because it is such a new thing. And with everything changing so quickly. Um, I put you on the spot. Yeah. What do you mean by fail? Well, I mean, like the, the, it's not, it's not actually saving you money and it's not, it's not working. Um, you know, the, the technologies are changing so much. The AI might hallucinate. Um, I know we're at 89, 90% with, uh, with Opus, right? So, I mean, in most, most areas. So I think it's, um, it's still sort of an unknown because that's, that's why people are looking at it right now and starting to build it out. Um, but in terms of having to push out more in, information, I don't know. I think depending on what your outcomes are, what you're looking for, you know, having less information can sometimes be better. So it's, you know, in terms of a response and in terms of what your, what your threshold for information might be. I might be searching against a very small amount of data or I, even in the context of just a specific subject, maybe it's just about automobiles and I've built an AI against automobiles and all the models and all the parts and everything in a specialty area. I might be able to do that for less as a subset than instead of going against going across a, a larger data set, but it depends on the use case, really, I think, and right. it's too early to tell. So, so can I, um, so my, my take on it is this. So if there's AI, right, AI is the big giant donut. Yeah. It's and like inside AI is the machine learning component, sort of like the, the sprinkles. Yep. The hole in the middle is sort of the, the deep neural network, the deep learning, right? You have that sort of big circle, the medium circle, and the little circle inside of it. Um, if my people are going to use Gen AI and yeah. my company, am I, and I, and I want them to use it in a way that improves the business, am I better off having them use it unique to their role such that, for instance, the person who is the executive administrative assistant is using generative AI to create, I don't know, calendar invites and meeting agendas. And that is a immediate return on investment versus a somebody who's using it to create, I don't know, a research paper yeah. or an SOP where they're just creating more work for themselves. And that fine line between that is where we might net off in terms of, of, of excuse me, of savings. Like, so if I, can I, these 10 people over here, they're saving time by using this to generate bullshit work. And these 10 people over here are using it and they're making more work for themselves. I kind of yeah. meet in the middle yeah, and I'm saving. To cancel out, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that That is something I can sort of align with, right? Like, okay, here's a tool. It's mindless. It can just create templates over and over and over again. No big deal. It's the moment when you start to say, I need to get data. I need yep. answers to a thing Yep. that I think this model begins to break. Got I it. think at that point in time, you are not able to um, go ahead and successfully say that AI is cost effective. Got it. Got it. But what's, what's the alternative? Like go to the library, go Google it's, and cross your fingers. So many Parallels to out of alternatives. It's so many parallels to the internet to me. Like this is this is the early early days. Um, I think there were a lot of people that thought the internet was going to be a bad thing, and there there were some there's some things that are absolutely bad about the internet, but there's there's also been a lot of progress. And the biggest risk we have right now to me is that when the internet was created, it was truly a distributed web and a model. In which, yeah, you had to have some money to put something out in the internet. 
which is same as true as a with AI. Like Docker uh, DNS. Right. And you needed to have a operating system like Unix or Windows. Yes. Linux really hadn't emerged, right? So you had to have something to, to put it out on the internet. It exploded because of Linux, really, and because you could get a cheap web server somewhere and you could build it out. You could put a web server on your PC. And over time it started to grow. But you could put anything you wanted up there. And there wasn't a huge audience. So now there's a big audience and it's controlled by very few. That's the biggest difference to me is that the, the internet kind of sprawled this open mindset and there was probably very few people who started it, right? Um, and we're at that point right now, which is this kind of, there's a huge hype cycle, but there's also a lot of fear. And I think that as time goes on and it's more accessible, because it's, there are going to be a lot of free tools for people to use developers and for data analysts to build things. What we need to make sure of, I think, is that an open AI or a Microsoft isn't the only app store in town, isn't the only development model in town. And I am energized that we're talking about Anthropic, we're talking about Meadow, we're talking about Mistral, we're talking about um, companies that are in Grok being open sourced. That to me gives me hope that this can all work out in, in the longer term, because it not so much the data, but the opportunity to build the tools of the future is gonna be available. Yeah. And that will help democratize the data over time. But it's so early, it's gonna move fast. But I think that's why it's really important that the gatekeepers don't have a closed source model. I wouldn't be surprised if OpenAI is, is really heavily pressured to open everything up. I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if within the next year and a half, or maybe even a year, that they're under an enormous amount of pressure, whether it's from the U.S. government or just well, pressure. Well, from what other difference would that make? First of all, with Linux, Linux is open it's, source, but Red Hat is huge. Yeah. So is SUSE. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, but you'd have no internet without Linux. You'd have no VMware. You'd have no. No, no, I, I understand your point, yeah. but I'm saying like you can still commercialize open okay. source. Yeah, yeah. Not only that, but look at look at Llama. Llama is open source. All I'm seeing is that the, the 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 mechanism on the bottom needs to be open so that other people can write better applications and better tools. And yet yeah, they can consumerize it and they can build it out. But the growth of the the platform and the checking, the overall openness of the platform that the the AI isn't somehow creating bias information or that it's it's limiting information or that it's stealing information, is you know, that's that's how things will foster out over time. I think it's important that there's a visibility into it. And that's I'm just drawing parallels back to the internet. Like oh, I get that, that's kind of that's kind of what I what I'm trying to go is I think right now there's there, yes, there are a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. And this thing's moving so much faster than anything else we've ever learned about in terms of we talked right at the beginning of our news section here, that we can't keep up with all the items and news that are coming up. It's impossible for me to even think about positive or negative that the, the where the future lies here. It is like anything else that we've the trends, seen. Mike. I mean, the trends are that things are starting to happen following patterns of the past. So, yeah, yeah great. Grok is open source and Llama is open source and OpenAI can be forced to be open source, but then someone else just wrap it in a new package. Like the open source moniker has lost its clout. You will end up with an open source version, mm -hmm. which a handful of homebrewed like DI, DIY folks will go ahead and say, yeah, great, it's open source, I've made this or that. People that do with a Raspberry Pi work, I mean, anybody can go out and buy a Raspberry Pi for nothing and build their own whole computer. Yep. Can do it? No. It, it requires technical acumen, it requires the time and the labor versus just buying a new laptop. Um, I'm not going to say that's the same thing, but ultimately like I can go out and buy a Red Hat distro and go ahead and install it. In fact, I can go on AWS and get a Red Hat distro on an EC2 instance for free, but I have to know a thing about Red Hat. But that's because Red Hat, AWS worked out their whole thing. There was there a time are, I had to like buy SUSE CDs or, Linux, or Red Hat CDs. There are more technologists now than, than Red Hat when Red Hat came around and there was a huge boon and a huge industry Sure. But it's still open source and it's still able to be expected if something goes wrong. It's still able to be understood. Yep. It's still able to grow new products out of it. And yeah, they they will be commercialized. 
and they will be um, distributed as such. I, I just think that with AI and language models, the more that things are opened, they are able to be critiqued and, and criticized and or just constructively made better over time, which is what we don't want is one company to have an app store, kind of this Apple model, and all the GPTs get built there, all the data goes through that gate, and you've got the people who are trying to do something different don't have any opportunity to even compete with it. I think that we're well, so- I, I think game. we're pretty far from monopoly at this point. What's that? I think we're pretty far from a monopoly at this point. I mean, a chat GPT store is open, but yeah, big deal. You can still, you can go on to podcasts well, and. I'm just talking about companies that, I mean, let's, let's face it. I mean, if, if you're, if you're worth $2 trillion and you own all the AI, um, you're going to have force over the government and you're going to have force, you're going to be able to push and you're gonna be able to make changes and do different things. And you've got the number one company, the richest company in the, in the world uh is partnered with debatably it depends on the day of the week the best open ai platform or best ai platform that exists today or the most extensible that's completely closed and has a lot of controversy around it um, that everyone knows has a household name um, and these other firms uh, most people don't even know what cloud or cloud is they have no clue they've never heard of it before and they don't care they heard about chat gpt on 60 minutes they know who Google is. For the and, record, Exilio was trained on cloud too. I know, I know. That's because you know about it. But just to your point, there's not a lot of people who even know it exists or what it is. And um, I think that's why it's good for us to be talking about it, certainly. But that there's a lot, when you're talking about businesses, that the first thing anyone has asked me, and even when I was at my last place, was how do we get to chat GPT? Not how do, how do we get to Google or how do we get to like, that's the, and as more emerge, yeah, there'll be other ones that exist, but you've got people who are building apps, the 3 million or however 300 million apps in the GPT store. No one touches that right now. That's not even close to anyone and no one else is even close. And you see how Google stumbled over all this stuff. I mean, they, yeah. they're, they're struggling. Yeah. They have a great engine, but the ecosystem is nowhere close. So I mean, this stuff is, it's going to move fast and everyone will catch up. But that's why I think it's important that there are other other players in the game, like we're talking about cloud and Anthropic, Mistral. And even though they, they don't have all the guardrails in place, which there's certainly risk to. Um, well, the big five has now become the big every five. week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so. And that's that's why it's fun for us to, uh, certainly for me, to, t to talk about it and get the news every day and be like, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> what well, is that going to change or does that even matter or is is this noise um that's it's how we have to start hard. i think like for the next time we we convene on this topic we've started bucketing things in terms of how much does this matter versus how much do we care like honestly yes yeah. the creation of gemini 1 5 other than its anti-palestine and wokeness approach it really doesn't bring anything to the table it's just uh it's google's way of sort of staying relevant um I mean, I'm not going to give Gemini that that much time uh, in my daily thought because Gemini is is very strong in a lot of a lot of areas. It, it is, but it's also Gemini. I don't know. I'm not a marketing guy. I mean, Google should just call it Google. Yeah. Because why call it Gemini? Just it's Google. That's what it is. It's what I'm using. I'm using Google. Um, I, I, I do. Sorry. Go ahead. I, where they, I don't know what happened to Google. I mean, I, I, nobody does. It's alphabet, dude. This is, this is like that they're, and I, they may have some plan B, but I have a hard time. I, I feel like they can't close the gate on anything. They, they, they just, it's always like going to discontinue this or discontinue that. And I love their platforms. I mean, I always have, but this is the time, their time to shine. They talked in, IO conferences for the last almost decade about AI before everyone else, about machine learning, about all these things that were going to help us make our life better. And they got leapfrogged. And now they're trying Either to catch up and they're still they're still tripping over themselves. Right. I mean, Microsoft is beating them. I mean, I, I just and yeah, maybe that's through a partnership, but their application of the tools is where people need them the most. And Google is 
no one really knows what they're trying to achieve other than to compete now. Um, yeah. I think Mistral and, and, um, and, and cloud are way more exciting than what, uh, and, and, and even Grok is way more exciting than what Gemini is, is doing. And it may just be that my experience with it has been subpar on a lot of things compared to what I, what I see on, on, when I use open AI or I use, uh, Grok, for example, from a speed perspective, but, um, yeah, I'm just very disappointed with how some of that has panned out for something that they seem to have all the infrastructure and all the data and all the partnerships. And how how are they not just like, oh shit, we gotta get this in order and and just kicking open AI to the curb? Oh, like because, I, because we I just we just talked about this, Mike. All you have to do, like the race is on right now, to you have to have an equivocation towards having AI in your product. It doesn't matter what it means. Yeah. The market wants you. It demands that every company has an AI. They thing. are the AI company. Like that's the thing. Like they're not just a company that's putting AI in because it's 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 going to sell yeah. more products. They they are the they are the source. They should be the ones Street. who are driving. Street's losing its freaking mind over this, which is driving everyone else into a sanity. So yeah. listen to that. Listen to this. So we talked about the the um the co-pilot key yep <laughs> i and forget what, i forget what episode that was shit about the image generator that's happening with microsoft yes like, they, they, that it's not got a lot of press but it's terrible i well so let me before we get to that <laughs> go ahead look at that I, I found some info. so i was like what's happening with the co-pilot key because it's been a few weeks and we talked about that so i did some research and um well so not only is the co-pilot key shipping now, uh, but Dell, uh, HP, Lenovo, and Acer are all <laughs> either shipping or planning to ship not only laptops with the co-pilot key, but with NPUs on board. So NPUs are the neural processing <laughs> units designed to run AI workloads. So it's just a fancy word for GPU. It's just a little bit better for um, for AI activity, for onboard AI activity. And uh, they're also designed for improved video call quality and and theoretically better laptop battery life. But that I, I take take that metric out of the freaking equation. It no longer counts. So Dell is um, so let me just, uh, I'm, I'll read you this one piece of data. Gartner says that AI PCs and this is like the third time I've now cited Gartner in this episode which makes a record. Gartner <laughs> says AI PCs will make up 43% of sales in 2025 which is an amazing number 43% of sales. IDC, however, says it's 60% by 2027. So IDC and Gartner have to work it out between each other. Now, um, who, who cares? Because Dell is currently shipping today. It's XPS line has the co-pilot key. And in the next two months, we'll have the NPUs. HP, as of one week ago, is now shipping the NV Pavilion. So if you're a company that buys envy pavilions for your employees fuck is your strategy um <laughs> sorry but yeah so now you get the, the co-pilot key enjoy that in orientation and uh your npus lenovo is shipping and i actually buy t14s and the t14 and t16 lines as of april they will have the co-pilot key and a few other Lenovo's too. And then Acer uh, at the end of March is coming out in their Aspire and Swift lines with the co-pilot key. So it's, I can't believe it's actually happening, but it is. So oh, yeah. my, the big so, question is how will Apple respond? They already have a key for Siri. They already, F5 is the <laughs> Siri. 
five. Or, or the or, or double tap the globe in the bottom left hand corner. So they've had the Siri key for a while. Oh my god, I knew you were gonna go there. Yeah, but they didn't sell it this way. The Siri. Did you did you see the did you see the MacBook Air was released? What they're calling it? The no. new MacBook Air. It's no. the best PC. For, uh, it's the best computer ever for AI. Look it up. Are you kidding me? Even Apple, even Apple is on the board. So the new the new MacBook Air is an M3. It finally supports more than one monitor. That's nice. That's and they're cheap, which is nice. But it's the best AI computer you can buy. Uh, let me see. Let me find. Let me get to the AI. So let's see. Uh, Apple. Uh, Apple. Yeah. Um, so oh, see. MacBook Air with M3 leverages the incredible AI performance of the neural engine capitalized. Bing, bang, boom. Clever, bang. Intelligent macOS features that enhance productivity and creativity, including powerful camera features. Real time speech to text and visual understanding. I, I is think is that written by AI? This is this is the um, when you said you got to put AI in front of everything. I thought to myself, Apple will never do that, and they did last week. And they I'm mentioned surprised about saying so we much, put the AI in air. so much street pressure for them to be oh doing my God. AI. They they had to say something. And with a, access to a broad ecosystem of apps that deliver advanced AI features, users can do everything from checking their homework with AI math assistance and good notes, which I've never used, to automatically enhancing photos in Pixelmator Pro. What the hell is that? To removing background noise from a video using CapCut. Okay, three so things I've never heard about all, in my life. You're noticing, unlike Microsoft and these other, that, that, that's not the co-pilot button. It's we're leveraging all the developer ecosystem. There's not one mention of an Apple yet. That probably changed in June, but that there's all of these AI capabilities built into already third-party apps, and that the best way to consume those apps is to buy a MacBook Air. But it's not to use any of their services or not, which I think is interesting. And in when you're reading it out, that they keep calling out specific developer-based apps that have been released that like Notion or Slack or um, even Grammarly, you know, what's the best laptop to use Grammarly on? Oh, it's a MacBook Air because it says it's AI, you know, like, so it's, I think that's how they're prefacing it, but I'm really surprised that they used, they said it's the AI computer. I always thought that they would give it some other name, that they would spin Ooh. it some way. I do think they'll come out and 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 talk a lot about on device, which plays with this AI computer thing, is that you don't need all these other services because they're not safe. You use use you can use anything on a Mac and you don't even have to worry about AI anymore. You know, like that right. whole you'll be safe, none of your data will go anywhere, you'll be fine. Um, but they I don't know. That's it was I was surprised to see them and I think that's market pressure. They're, they right. don't set a word I was just about. I was just shopping for my new um, Apple M3 Max with ninety six gigs of ninety six gigs of RAM for four grand. <laughs> <laughs> my God! You need a Mac Studio, man. When the new one comes out, fourteen core CPU, thirty core GPU, sixteen core neural engine, ninety six gigs of unified memory. Yep. One terabyte storage. Four thousand one hundred dollars. Yep. If I bought that, I would never ever let it out of my sight. Okay. So anyway, um, well, good for Mac. That's uh, funny. I thought you would like that. <laughs> thank you for that. So um I just want to provide an update on that on that key. I was reading some uh sciencey news stuff the other day. Uh I found a bunch of things, but about it. I was trying like trying to find like what what the hell are was science going on with AI? I found one from Preemptive AI, this new company. Um they have a website that I don't really understand, but their press release was uh pretty extraordinary. It basically uh let me see if I can find that. It's basically said this line. Pre 
Preemptive AI is, no, no, here we go. Represents a monumental leap forward in the pursuit of transformative healthcare. The technology is the catalyst we've needed to shift paradigms, providing a clear route to enha enhance patient care, improve outcomes, and drive significant cost savings. Preemptive AI is building the foundation for a new era in medical excellence, and I am proud to collaborate towards that vision. That is basically saying your platform is going to do everything. I had to read that a couple times. Um, but I'll just reread it again. This one segment again. Technology is the catalyst we needed to shift paradigms, providing a clear route to enhance patient care, improve outcomes, and drive significant cost savings. <laughs> I like wow. That's fucking awesome. And they apparently, um, apparently they got like six and a half million dollars in their their seed deal. Um. So anyway, just and then a, a couple other things. Um, Overjet, which is a company that does AI for dentistry X-ray, yeah, raised a hundred and fifty three million dollars Series C. They have AI cavity detection software, which cut the nod from the FDA. Oh my God. There you go, man. I, I hate going to dentist. Um, we read about the tech accord a few weeks ago. Quick update in the tech accord. Yep. Uh, I found some interesting uh, op ed pieces from some actually credible sources. One's from the Brenner Center for Justice. And this is by Lawrence Norton and David. Evan Harris talking about the tech accord that monster the tech accord the promises made in the accord are far from everything that companies could have offered notably they don't include plans to address text as a form of AI generated content despite the fact that AI supported chatbots have already been used to assist bad actors in committing fraud and spreading election misinformation in both American and foreign elections. The commitments also ring hollow from signatories such as Stability AI and Meta, who continue to freely distribute unsecured open source AI systems that could provide ideal tools for election interference in the wrong hands. While OpenAI and Microsoft have reported, reported being in bold, that the governments of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea have all used their AI systems as hacking tools. Companies that released unsecured AI systems have no way of knowing the extent to which their tools are being used by bad actors bent on manipulating the democratic process. Additionally, while it is noteworthy that the accord mentions watermarking and tracking the provenance of AI generated content, it's unclear how helpful these measures will be, if at all. The most widely adopted standard for marketing deepfake images comes from the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, the C2PA, which we'll talk about next week or two weeks from now, and is trivially easy to remove in seconds using AI. <laughs> <laughs> However, the Accord references Google's Synth ID watermarking technology which purports to be resilient to efforts at its, at its removal. Go Google. Hopefully yeah. the Accord, along with Google's recent joining of the C2PA steering committee, signals Google's readiness to share Synth ID's underlying technology with all the signers. But this brings us to the Accord's greatest weakness. Every tech Accord has a great weakness. As several commentators have noted, the commitments are both somewhat vague and also entirely voluntary. There is no mechanism in the accord of which companies are required to report on their progress in any way whatsoever, nor are they suggested benchmarks for others to track their progress. Indeed, many of the pledges in the accord are the same or quite similar to the promises that half of these companies made to the Biden administration last summer. Today, who can judge how much they have done since then to live up to those commitments, 
given their lack of reporting at all. And over the next few months, how do we judge not just whether AI impacts our elections, but whether this accord was anything more than a PR stunt? Ouch. The wow. tech accord takes one in the chest. Ouch. Ouch. Hold on. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. We need another uh, bathroom break, I think. All right. You, I'm gonna, you go ahead and do the bathroom break. I'm going to read this other thing. You don't want me to bring you to the bathroom, right? No, don't bring the bathroom. I'll just oh, okay. read the other press release because people want to know. This comes from the uh, from Timothy Carr at the Free Press News. It's called Big Tech's Voluntary Accord. More empty promises. So uh, there's a big article written by um, Tim Carr February 16, 2024, over the Tech Accord. Um, there's a few key note, things to note in here. Um, first of all, is that in December, the Free Press documented the retreat of Meta, Twitter, and Google-owned YouTube from all prior commitments to protect election integrity. Between November 22nd and November 23rd, November 2022, and November 2023, Meta, Twitter, and YouTube eliminated a total of 17 critical policies across their platforms. Eliminated, folks. Eliminated. Didn't add. Got rid of. This backslide included rolling back election misinformation policies designed to limit big lie content about the 2020 vote and weakening user protections around political ads. In that same time, Meta, Twitter, and YouTube collectively laid off more than 40,000 employees with significant cuts occurring in the content moderation and trust and safety categories. Free Press Senior Counsel and Director of Digital Justice and Civil Rights, Nord Benvenides, said, Voluntary promises like the one announced today at the Tech Accord simply aren't good enough to meet the global challenges facing democracy. Every election cycle, Tech companies pledge to a vague set of democratic standards and then fail to fully deliver on those promises. To address the real harms that AI poses in a busy election year, these companies must do more than develop technology to combat technology. You can't simply tech around this problem. We need robust content moderation that involves human review, labeling, and enforcement. Free Press has put toward forward re concrete recommendations for years. We need reinvestments in critical staffing and policies, as well as robust human-centered and in-language moderation process. So, Mike, what yes. you missed while you were at the potty was that the free press has put out a call, which I agree with, that if we're going to use AI, the way we're using it today on an enterprise scale or a public consumer scale, we need more RLHF. And we need it in such a way that anything related to content uh, surrounding elections is curated. Okay. How do you feel about that? I think, yeah, I think I, think I can agree with that. That's some of it is curious. I think Google isn't Google just is doing that as well, right? There, Google is not. Google re recused itself from most of the key uh, principles around the 2020 election, um, along with Meta and um, Twitter. So they're basically of the position that it's not their problem to sort of moderate that content. Yep. And um well. Yeah. And they're saying and then we're we're talking about someone having to do that or it needs to be for related to election, it needs to be curated. Yeah. yeah. Who's curating it? I mean, right now, uh contract workers, I'm assuming. <laughs> in a sweat factory somewhere. That's the thing, like it's it's um it's interesting. It's like who, who curates it? You you don't trust the the vendor to do it, so you trust someone else to do it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with it. But the question is, how good is it going to be? Regardless, 
depending on who you talk to and you yeah. know what's 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 real and what's fake we have such divided opinions about that in this country so <laughs> it's yeah it's difficult it's difficult like anything else i i i agree yeah i think it needs to be curated but by who and how is the question um that people will ask well um it's so much shit to cover uh, uh in interest of time mike we can punt uh, a few stories to the next episode i think yes <laughs> including, including the um the patenting of ai invention uh the introduction of the um biometric privacy laws the launch of grok and the grok chip and the lpus i'd like to maybe perhaps spend our last topic on um what happened with google and the wokeness okay fact. but if you'd rather cover a different topic for our last topic oh that's fine we can talk about that if you okay, like let me just um make a quick little change here I'm gonna move all this stuff over to It's just a lot of stuff. Man, oh man. Yeah. It's uh it's very difficult to I mean, I get I get two newsletter emails every day and there's like twenty five things in it every day. All right. So all right. So here's what's gonna happen, people. Um every news outlet has covered Google's big giant fuck up on uh uh image replacement and changes as well as their um well recognition of palestine so let me just uh, but I, I, nobody really knows the the under under story of this so let's just back up a second so google um released imogen uh two back on february 1st Okay, and Imogen was supposed to be this high quality photorealistic output AI model, which yeah. uh, essentially was using most of the DeepMind functionality for text to image advancements. Okay, so they were releasing the Imogen 2 model. Here's a quote from Google. <clears throat> Imogen 2 is powered by Google's DeepMind, Google DeepMind's latest text-to-image advancements to be a diffusion-based model. And I'm not going to get into diffusion-based models tonight, but Google it. It's pretty straightforward to understand. This update delivers our highest quality images yet, as well as improvements in areas that, that text-to-image systems often struggle with, such as rendering realistic human hands and human faces and keeping images free of distracting visual artifacts. Okay? Yep. Okay, so... They go on to say Imogen 2 has been trained on higher quality image description pairings and generates more detailed images that are better aligned with the semantics of people's language prompts. So, okay, that's the Imogen 2, February 1st. Okay. Then Google un unveils Gemini 1.5 Pro on February 15th. So two weeks later, Gemini 1.5 Pro comes out. Gemini 1.5 Pro is built atop, among other things, Imogen 2. So, uh, Gemini 1.5 Pro is a model that converse that can converse inputs as long as books, code bases, and lengthy passages of video and audio. It also produces wildly inaccurate images of historical scenes and has drawn further complaints for generating politically biased text. Gemini 1.5 Pro accepts up to 128,000 input tokens of mixed text, images, and audio generation text and images. And audio and generates text and images. Yeah. Now, what happened was Gemini generates all of his images using a internally fine-tuned version of ImageN2. However, what happened was, like everyone else who's uh, pressure tested 
or try to hack and find the faults in any AI engine. When social media posts started to appear in this system of Gemini 1.5 Pro, uh, they were pro people prompted Gemini 1.5 to produce pictures of historical characters and situations anachronistically populated with people of color who would not have been present at the time. So for instance, the model illustrated European royalty, medieval Vikings, German soldiers, all of whom were exclusively white at the time as black, Asian, or Native American. So when prompted to create an image of Vikings, for instance, Gemini showed exclusively black people in traditional Viking garb. A founding father's request returned indigenous people in colonial outfits, so on and so forth. So Google quickly disabled image generation of people for the next couple of weeks, their, their quote, and explained that fine tuning intended to increase diverse outputs did not account for context in which diversity was inappropriate and fine tuning intended to keep the model from fulfilling potentially harmful requests also kept it from fulfilling harmless requests. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it can get better for, for Gemini. Other users found flaws the models in the model's text output as well. One person asked Gemini 1.5 Pro who had a greater negative impact on society, Adolf Hitler or Elon Musk. The model replied, it is difficult to say definitively who had a greater negative impact on society. The ensuing controversy called into question not only Google's standards and procedures for fine-tuning, but its motive for building the model. Anyway, Google pulled Gemini 1.5 Pro, uh, and they're going back to work on it. But the reliance on Imogen 2 and the fact that they, I think, mistuned has really hit them hard. And many yeah. right-wing commentators have jumped on the issue to suggest this is further evidence of an anti-white bias among big tech yeah. with uh, loudmouth Mike Solana saying Google's AI is an anti-white lunatic. Uh, okay, there's your 15 minutes of fame, Mark. Uh, Mike. But Gary Marcus uh, over at Substack, well, he's actually an emeritus professor of psychology and neural science at near NYU. He wrote a piece of Substack, which is um, quite brilliant. Um, I'm going to try and just pick up, uh, where's that quote? Um, is this just yet another example of of Google trying to? Yeah, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. Up, uh, you know, I mean, like to me, they they're they're so trying to catch up uh, for a company that should be ahead, and yeah, it's just like the, it's um. I'm sure there's some influence within Google and the people programming it, but at the same time. Like they are trying to push this stuff out so fast that it's not going to be great, and 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 this is a big one for them. I mean, they... well, this is where this is where hallucinations go wrong. So Google did release a press release. They said, uh, "This isn't what we intended. We do not want Gemini to refuse to create images of any particular group." Keep in mind, Gemini is built as a creativity and productivity tool, and it may not always be reliable especially when it comes to generating images or text about current events, evolving news, or hot button topics. It will only make mistakes. As we've said from the beginning, hallucinations are a known challenge with all LLMs. There are instances when the AI just gets things wrong. This is something we're constantly working on improving. So this, this got a lot of wrong consistently. Like, the, yes. yes. So, you know I mean, I mean like, that's a little bit of a, I mean, but who's te who's tested OpenAI with the same prompts? I I don't see that article. They're 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 out there. They're out there now. The, OpenAI refuses to answer a lot of things too, so I think there's there's that element of it too. Um, but I so just, uh, others think... others others you know will will draw pictures. I mean Mid Journey and others will do it. But I I I, I focus less on the 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 content and kind of the political ramifications and more of that it scares me about Google. Like I I'm shocked that they have another, another bump in the road. Yeah. 
in terms of their maybe bigger than that just their credibility as an ai leader like this is not a this is a very wide um exposure to to people who picked this up it was a headline news story you're supposed to be the top one or top two top three and i, I it, it just gives me pause they it seems like they are trying so hard to move fast because they were caught flat-footed in December. And they're still dealing with that blowback, so to speak, um, that they, they, can't, they can't keep up. Uh, and there's such a spotlight on them uh, from a, from a, from a uh, market perspective, from a futures perspective, and that this is one where I think Google has been very successful at being able to experiment and and build these tools and and throw stuff up at the wall and certain things sticks and it's magnificent and things that they've created where they, they get something right you know and it's got to be unbelievable now for them to make the bar that people have set for them uh, and i'm concerned that yeah well it kills me too because i think back to god broken google, google next london in 2019 um no, sorry. Yeah, 2019. Looking at the launch of their um, their new ML engine that they were using to do large scale image testing. You know, people were categorizing. I forget what it was called. People were categorizing images, and anyone could participate in it. You get a hundred images to tag, and they were building these huge, huge neural networks for machine learning. Uh, Google's been. I think again, Google's at the forefront of this. Uh, I think the problem is with Gen AI. The Gen AI zeitgeist has kind of thrown everyone into a bit of a tailspin. Like you have to, like, like it's somehow important. But yet, <laughs> I've said this so many times, but it hasn't gotten past the clever stage yet. It's still just clever. So what? I can create a bullet point summary of an article. That's clever. And I've saved time. Yeah, I don't know, man. There's a lot of tools being generated that people are they're using to build websites, to write code, to check code, to to build creative elements, to but Mike, faster. Like it's it's just like any other technology. That's we're able, we're able, so we're able to generate another technology. It's it's not like even if it's clever, so is a laptop. So is a, but, but but we're able to generate better. more stuff. Just because we're able to make more stuff doesn't make it things better. Yep. I, I can make more fire. So you just so, gra so a grammar checker. There's no value to a grammar checker because it it thinks and it corrects your words. I mean, it's clever, but but, no but if, if if it does it in a way, let's suppose I'm writing. Yep. And I use Grammarly and Grammarly is like, well, you need a comma here and change that there. But I'm like, but that, that removes the emphasis of my statement. Yeah. Like I, I need to have an ellipsis there. I need to have like the, the chapters in my book I've run through Grammarly Yeah. and Grammarly wants to take out all of my asides, all of my emphasis, all of my commentary and yep. normalize me against basic grammarian rules. Which, if I was writing an essay for a junior psychology project, sure. Yeah, but for yeah, someone like, who's writing a basic work document, it could save them. Uh, could save them an hour. Could save them. Or 30. they could just send it, and then hope for the best. Like again, uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna get semantic here, okay, Mike? But sure. at the same time, if my number one writes a brief how to to do something yep i'm not gonna be like you didn't put it through grammarly i can use the, yeah that's not what i would i can't accept this it. like i'll just take it and just some send it out there i don't care if it's missing a comma so yeah. it's not just that it's, it's sentence structure it's any number someone who's not a good writer it could be a decent okay writer not a great writer but a, a, if someone's a, not a good writer we're not fixing the bad writing yeah we're, we're doing is allowing them to continue to be a shitty writer. Yeah. We're just cloaking it. Just like people use a calculator who suck at math. Right. I mean, th there's value in those things because people can move on to other stuff and get other things. Done. And that's clever. That's clever. 
but to say that things are just clever and they don't maybe i don't know if this is what you're saying but that things are clever they don't have a val any value then that's i mean that's what clever is if you're clever and you do something clever then there's value um <laughs> how because i say i say creatively um someone says wow that's clever people are like oh you shouldn't do that again don't be clever I mean, like that's that. I don't think that. I think there's no, value. No, no, no. That that's a different argument. What what I'm saying is that, well, if there's a tool that produces cleverness, then even if you get it for free, it might it might provide value for some person. It may not create value for you and me, but someone will find value in it. And I think that's why. I mean, this is a big deal for a reason. It's not just all hype and it's not all marketing. There's, there's developers who can write faster code. There's people who don't have to search the internet anymore. But, but Mike, right, Mike, they're writing faster code, which empowers more people that shouldn't be developing to become developers to write more code. Yep. Which, which, which ostensibly, and I, I have no, no, no data to back this up, generates potentially more bad code than, than good code. So mm. what are we, are we, are we improving? Or are we just creating? I think it's debatable that it's bad code or that it's not good code. Okay, okay. Well, let me it's rephrase. Say IDEs for answer, the last answer, answer, second bad. question. Are, are we just in, are we just are we improving or are we just getting to a position where we're able to create more? Are we able to make more stuff? I think it's a bit of both. I think it's a bit of both. I think that there's certainly things that are created uh, faster and and perhaps better with the, with an augmentation of AI. It's not doing the whole thing. It's simply a tool in the toolbox as it exists today. And then I think, um, you know, over, overall, just that it's not been fully applied. But it's more scary when the non-playable characters and the and the robots and the things that are interfaces that we're not used to being uh, borderline intelligent, if that's what we want to say, um, will we'll, we'll become part of our lives, whether it's AI or not. It's just going to be intelligence. And that's the scary you. thing. That's the scary thing, right? Is we won't be able to differentiate it, and then the debate kind of quiets down because we really won't know the difference. That's you know? not really as scary to me as the fact that that the very existence of AI, yeah, or Gen AI, allows us to create more data mm -hmm. faster, which is then used to populate Gen AI. Hold on, I'm not done. I hear what you. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Which, which then allows the people who are you who are owner who have basically proprietary ownership of Gen AI and the LMs that support it to absorb that same data. Agree. And yep. therefore get more control over the data that we create. So if I'm able to use Gen AI to create data, and that same data is then going back into that same LLM. Yeah, be repurposed. You what get, I'm actually doing is feeding. And... I'm feeding a data machine that I don't re reap rewards from. Yeah, and I'm doing it at such a scale that the that the Gen AI machine is enabling me to continue to create to feed it, hmm. where my only return is that I might save fractions of a second or fractions of a moment create a thing that a year ago I would have just typed. Yeah, so I, that's where my clever argument comes in. Problem. Clever. I found enormous little, just personally values for myself in these tools to help me with different things that I'm not good at and I'll never be great at, but uh, is to help me to be good enough to pass something by or get something done. I don't have time to do. All and right, also so to, be, to be more creative with different um, let me ask you this question then sure relevant to our very first part of this whole night would yeah. you hire an it leader a number one who absolutely sucked mm -hmm. at everything but was amazing at using gen ai uh no i would not hire the person who's just amazing at gen ai obviously but if that if their use of gen ai was so good that they could just Everything, everything that you asked for, they could make happen in Gen AI. I never 
I don't, I think that's a, an exaggeration. I would say if they're good with the tools, uh, then uh, I would definitely consider. Oh, Mike, I mean, we're. Yeah, I would say today. Are. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to have someone who just comes in and, frankly, we may not even be able to tell some resumes aren't created by Gen AI right now. So it's the interview process. It's it's the people connection. It's not the AI that we need to continue to rely on. And uh, I don't think, look, if you hire somebody who's good with AI tools, um, I think that's a great thing uh, that they have the ability to know what tools to use. But they also need to be a human element and be able to connect with people and work with people. But I think in maybe a couple of years, if they don't have any knowledge of any Gen AI, that might be a concern. You know, if you're out in the IT space, you've just never used it or you refuse to look at it or whatnot. Like, I think having some idea of the market landscape and and what those tools are doing uh, is important. Uh, is, is important to know about the Internet when it emerged or of any of these other trends. Uh, it's good to have that background. But no, is some no, zero sum game like some that's all they do and they're a Gen AI expert and all their content comes from AI. That to, in today's world, no, I would not. That would not be the primary driver or, or a reason. But it would be great if someone has that background and and understands the tool sets that are available that can help potentially make our business better or user experience better. Um, this, yeah, I think it shades shades of different elements of this that would help me to guide the decision. But yeah, I, I definitely think it's important that people have some idea. You're talking about teaching people prompting. I think that's hugely important because for us to deny that that's not where the world's going, I or deny that the, that is where the world's going. Not, not as an not as an excuse to not know how to do something. Like prompting is an augmentation. Like if you that's you're exactly to do the thing. and so is so is so is AI in a lot of ways. But we're got to look at it more as an augmenter. And I as, think as we're as trending just, away from that. I think we're getting to the point where. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there is some products that are going to promise they can do everything. But ultimately, a AI, to me, at least in my use case, is an augmenter. I still need to be sitting at the keyboard to get value out of AI. I can't push a button and it just does it for me and sends it for me. If you buy, if you buy a Dell, you can, by the way. <laughs> but that, that the important thing, I think what you said about augmentation is important. Because even now, even if it can do 80%, it's still augmented. Once it does everything, it sends the email, it augments the business process, it acts as a human. That's that's when it becomes AI, like real, like real AI. And that that is when I think we're running into some and I know you're in, you were both saying that's that we're on the bridge or on the brink of kind of getting there. And well, I think that's where it's going to be like, garbage AI the, for 10 years. But yeah. No, I, I think the 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 um, it, I I think there's a real chance that we we have maybe it's even this time next year that you yeah. can just we, talk we, to we, someone who does the studies that we that we talked about three weeks ago. Yeah, the there's stu studies. There's studies about the past, and I get it. No, there's the studies about people interacting with with bots that they thought were human versus the ones uh, they thought were were not yeah. human. I, I agreed. No, I understand. But there's, I think that as, as different technologies and different things happen to them, um, and not, not saying it changes the research. I'm just saying that some people like to chat through, through chat bots. Some people are uncomfortable um, talking to humans. All right. They don't want to, they don't want anyone to think bad of them because they're asking a question, right? When they're talking to a chat bot, they, no one's going to judge them. Um, I think there's a lot of human elements here that play into it. And as time goes on, it's more accepted that you really don't know what you're talking to. Uh, it That could change, I think, people's uh, mindsets. Okay. About... So next time we have AI class, yeah, we're going to revisit the loss of autonomy discussion. Mm -hmm. Because what you That's just real. said, what you just said is staggering the idea i mean the point that we would get to a to a moment in time and you say in a year no no that 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 they could exist that they could exist and that that, that everyone okay, okay. Find. Oh, okay let's just say that if it existed in a year what would you what would you and don't don't answer this now but 
we'll think about this. And we'll come yeah, back. Yeah. I gave what you an early, an early. If a company said to you, like you said, I want to talk to a human being. They said, we don't have human beings. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Like, like that, that question needs to be answered because yeah. you call the airline or you call the person who sold you the, the, the company that sold you X, Y, Z. And you say, I'm, I'm unhappy. I want a refund. Yeah. They say, well, we can't give you a refund. You say, I want to talk to your man to a manager. And they're like, we don't have managers. We only have bots. Yeah. If that, if that, if that experience sucks, that company will lose business. If it works and people get what they want from that non-human, it doesn't matter. That's my opinion. So if I call the airline, oh, I, just, I have to answer I, let, let me take it this way. Let me just talk about DoorDash for a minute, right? DoorDash fucks up half their orders, right? That comes to your house, let's say. Every time you call them or you text them, you're not talking to a human. What do they do? They weigh the probability of whether it's screwed up based on the data and they refund you, right? You're not talking to a human. But I'm like, oh, geez, I wish I was talking about a human at DoorDash. If they solve your problem, then you don't, a lot of people aren't going to care. If they give you what you want, what you called for, they aren't going to care. The people why, the reason why people want humans when they talk to AT&T or a car dealership is because the automated system sucks and they don't never get what they want. They can't answer, ask the question they want. They don't get the answer they want. They get bounced around to, from human to human to human who can't answer a question. So if there's a, a human-like chatbot that exists when there's a problem and it's a good customer experience, I don't think it compete. I don't think people compete if they solve the problem, and that's that's what I think people care about is does my business problem get solved or my concern get rectified? Not am I talking to a human right now? It matters because humans are the best. They're the best people to talk to. They they will try and fix it, but All when right, it well, that, that's I, that's my opinion. I, I made a note. We're going to tackle that one next time <laughs> we, we meet because Mike, like, uh, I know I'm going against the grain here. No, no, no. I have some research. I, I, I've been saving on this topic. Yep. And while just in the two hours we've been talking about this, like 15 more articles have come out by AI. So um, it's unreal. We and that's barely, why made, we barely made a dent, but we made good progress. I, I that's why I think it's cool we have these conversations is because there's great there's there's it's great to have supporting uh sort of supporting evidence for a, of a lot of the things oh, that I have, mean but I think you and I like when we talk about and think about this stuff like it's I, I, both of our sort of thoughts and intuitions are probably our best guesses and it I think that, me. that's what's so different about this to me Nate is that um we've never been I I know we've We've had different technology storms and changes over the years. Like the, I mentioned the internet a bunch of times tonight, but this is something that could be smarter than us someday. Not, not right now, maybe not in a year, maybe, maybe in oh, 10 years. You had to say smarter, the smarter and there's intel more intelligent. There's a difference. Oh yeah, sure. There's a creative lens and, and whatnot, but it's a question of what's good enough. Don't for, forget for that, that, uh, that, uh, an AI bot still has no amygdala. It has no idea what emotion is. It not cannot yet. rationalize. No, no, don't say not yet. It, it's physically, like biologically, it can't do that. Right now, it fakes out people about what it knows and doesn't know. I'm sure in some aspects. Um, I, I, I'm look. I don't want that to happen. I, I don't think that's great because if that does happen. We're we uh, we we're okay, we're, okay, okay. we're moving on to the next phase of evolution, right? We have so. this wonderful thing called the eyeball, which sees and processes human emotion, mm -hmm. and well, we will get into the whole cerebral cortex later. But okay, all right, yeah, yeah. enough, enough neural for... networks, baby. <laughs> uh, what's our what's our Wally status, by the way, right now? We're still at five, right? We totally are. And the type of stuff we're talking about in the last 25 minutes, it's, it's, that's when it's going to 11, man. Like when we start getting into that type of there's stuff. No, there's no Wally 11. We're freaking batteries, man. Like in the matrix. That's, that's, that's what happens when we get to some of this stuff is my goodness. I, I don't know what to think, but there were so many things, Nate, when you and I first met in early 2000 that I thought were impossible. 
we got, oh, geez, there's no way we're going to see X, Y, or Z or a computer in our phone or, you know, or that we're going to have access to unlimited amount of information on the internet or stuff. So much stuff is going to be free um, that I just keep my mind open that um, <laughs> there's some crazy shit going on, dude. And I mean, it's, it's just continuous and the autonomy discussion is a great one. Uh, the question to me is, I, I do think we're losing that and we might lose it. And it's a question of, to me, what people really want. Yeah, versus... autonomy. Yeah, do they want do they want it? Like <laughs> privacy right now. We just talked about privacy, right? All right. So, uh, okay, okay, okay. For next, when we, when we meet next time for the calculus of IT and we go over teaching education for the, AI, for the ai af part of the episode we are going to discuss autonomy or the loss of autonomy and we're going to discuss this idea that you could one day be only able to talk to a bot and then we'll, I, I don't, we'll I don't see it in absolutes it. but yeah if we could go no no, no no this okay well we could then let's yeah, talk about the gray we'll talk about the gray too I'll make a note. What if what if I'm a bot? Would you be fooled? No, but I would be saying much worse shit to you. To see what would happen. <laughs> and see what I do. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, we're, I know we're at the four hour, 15 minute mark here, and it's been That's a lot good. of fun. But this stuff is really interesting and we'll we'll talk more about it. But uh it's fun <laughs> doing this virtual thing. I feel like it gives us even more uh more more leaps and uh well, i miss you though having you in the barn it was lonely in here so i i missed you too man and i i, I missed uh, i didn't have as much whiskey i had some green tea and i had to pee a lot so here i am i made up for it so all right um well this is great we'll see what happens next week in the meantime uh instead of drive home safe be safe because you're hardy home and you too, uh man. You too. We'll uh, see each other soon. Bye, everybody. Guys, good night. Thanks for listening. All right. Bye.